Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the fourth episode of the MMA Roundtable. We've had a lot of fun doing the first three, so looking forward to doing this fourth episode. This week, we got a huge fight to break down. Anderson Silva, obviously, uh, going up to fight Stefan Bonner, put on a show. We had a, a, a ton of, uh, of uh, other great fights in Brazil to bring you to. Uh, Big Nog, Glover Deshera, John Fitch, all putting on shows. So without further ado, let's get into it. And uh, we are here with the fourth episode of the MMA Roundtable. Are uh, you all 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 right? I'm all right. Oh, fantastic! I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> you guys all right? Spot on. Doing great. <laughs> and uh, yeah, big shout out to our listeners and of course to our partners at MMA Mental. Um, every Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Myself and Chris from the MMA Podcast and Ray and Patrick from MMAMental.com come together to do this four-man roundtable podcast. Uh, you want to plug MMA Mental and let us know your uh, current and future guests, Ray? Yeah, absolutely. We've uh, we've just been uh, at our first press pass and we, we covered an event this weekend, which was amazing. We, we covered uh, Lockdown and MMA, which was in Manchester. That was an, an amateur event. There were some fantastic fights. Uh, lots of great submissions and some, and some great knockouts. So we've posted all the videos to those fights that are uh, on our site, which is obviously www.mmmental.com, which is definitely worth coming to. We've got three guests lined up. We've got a, a UFC welterweight lined up, and we've also got two uh, UK prospects. We've got a, a heavyweight uh, and a, a, a bantamweight that's about to make his Bama debut. So the heavyweight's name is Paul Taylor. Uh, he's currently three and two. One of his defeats is to Jeff Monson. So we've got him on next week. Next week is a... a an up-and-coming prospect on the UK scene. Uh, making his debut for Bat in Bama, we've got Spencer Hewitt. He's been on the show before. He's a great guest, a, a massive prospect in the UK. I think a lot's expected of him. And we've managed to get a really, really, I think, a really great guest. And I, I think he's going to be it's going to be interesting to talk to because he's, he's one of those people that's really, he's, he's out there. He's quite wacky, really. But we've got Brian Ebersole on as well, which is going to be very interesting. Oh, nice! Yeah, he's he uh, he's kind of bounced back and forth from being a known to an unknown, but he's definitely made himself known in the past few months. Stepping up from uh, from I think he was in Bellator, right? Uh, hey, just uh, uh, before he he was brought into uh, the UFC. Yeah, he had a fight with Hector Lombard, didn't he? He's had quite a lot of uh, big fights away from the UFC, but I think since he's joined the UFC, he's made quite an impact. He had he obviously had the big fight with. Uh, with Chris Lytle, and he's he's had some really good fights, and obviously he lost his last fight to James Head, but up until that point, he'd actually looked really good. Yeah, no, I was actually thinking of uh, of a a bunch of uh, different ones, uh, CFC being the main one he was fighting in, um, in his UFC hiatus, uh, he's come back, and and I think he's 4-1 uh, since rejoining the UFC last year. So, uh, yeah, beat some name guys like Dennis Holman and Chris Lytle. I'm definitely going to tune into that, as should you guys. Um, along with tuning into the MMA podcast, uh, we're a live podcast. And if you're listening to us on Ustream, uh, just bookmark the link because we're live on this same link. Uh, Ustream.tv slash channel slash the MMA podcast. Uh, you can check us out at uh, at the MMA Podcast on Twitter, themmapodcast.com, and the call-in number for both this show and our podcast is 213-457-3380. Last week, we actually purposely didn't have a guest because it was our first go-around on Ustream. We wanted to make sure everything went smoothly before we started bringing people on and really had a grasp of the new system before uh, before we called up some important people, but we're pretty confident with it now actually reached out to Michael Chivello and Joey Coco Diaz on Twitter um, earlier today. Neither have gotten back with me yet. <laughs> actually, Joey Diaz just got uh, put back on Twitter. He was banned for Twitter from a couple days because his avatar was actually a picture of his testicles. So he got, got the boot Ugh. for a couple days, but now... The Twitter gods have brought him back. I mean, he has seventy five thousand followers. So, and and not just seventy five thousand followers, seventy five thousand rabid followers. So he was uh, brought back pretty quickly. But yeah, without any further ado, let's get into UFC one. 
uh, 153. Before we get into the first fight, we we break down. What were your impressions of it? You know, obviously in Brazil in front of that rabid crowd. Uh, you know, crowd or not, that was one of the best lineups of fights I've seen in a really long time. Every single one impressed me. You know, most most people have have trouble with uh, decisions. The one that went to a decision, Fitch versus Silva may have been my my favorite one. That was that was a barn burner as well. I had I had a lot of fun watching these uh fights. Uh what did you all think, uh Chris? Oh, that was just fantastic, man. It's about time. There have been cards that have been decent. Like 152 was obviously very solid. Um and you you go back uh through the year and and not many cards that we've had have had this caliber of uh, wars. I mean, just about every single fight was a back and forth war. A lot of surprises. You know, we had Fitch getting a win in there against a guy that I thought was going to steamroll him. You know, he made his comeback and we just had all these wars where guys were just getting completely smashed. Anderson Silva put in another flawless performance. I, I want to say so far, that's uh, my favorite fight card of the year. I, I thought it was a brilliant card. It, it was just it, it, every fight was exciting, like I've just said, and the, even the prelims were exciting as well. I mean, there was just some great fights, some great finishes, some really standout performances. You mentioned a few there. I thought Damian Meyer looked phenomenal. Glover Teixeira looked phenomenal. Phil Davis looked phenomenal. There was just some really, really solid performances and exciting fights. Yeah, there, there certainly were. It was a, it was a very good card, and another one of those cards, kind of built around style matchups, even if uh, there weren't the biggest names, you know, your uh, Honey Jason versus Sam Cecilia, uh, both fresh off their respective seasons of the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, perhaps not the biggest name value, but there was a lot of name value in the card, and uh, where where there wasn't, there was a great style matchup, and, uh, you know, even if uh, no one was familiar with the fighters that were on this card, they, they certainly will be now after all the great performances that were turned in this weekend. Yeah, I had a lot of fun watching the uh, fights. I actually <clears throat> had a, a little bit of a uh, debate. I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to stay out of the bars and watch college football or uh, return home because for for some reason, I don't know why, but, but the uh, bar I was actually at was showing like some low-rate college football game, which I love college football, but it was like number 20 versus number 25. And they weren't showing the fight, <clears throat> and uh, I was ha- I was having a bunch of fun with with the people I was out with, but I overall I uh, ultimately made the uh, decision like yo I'm I'm gonna roll roll back and watch these fights, and I was definitely definitely awarded for doing so. Um, <clears throat> you had Anderson Silva on the main card, and and those uh, those definitely were you know a a uh, fight card with with Anderson Silva on it. Um, it's, uh, always, always will entertain, but let's, let's get first to, to the knockout of the night. Um, it was, uh, the only fight we'll, we'll cover that wasn't on the main card of UFC 153. Honey Jason knocking out Sam Cecilia with punches, um, second round, about four minutes in. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, normally don't see a guy who wasn't on the main card sitting next to a Anderson Silva at the post-fight press conference, but it was such an impressive knockout. They put him front and center at, at the post-fight press conference, the ultimate fighter champion, uh, really starting to move up those featherweight ranks. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was a really good fight. I mean, the pair of them just went for it. I mean, literally went toe to toe. Uh, I mean, I picked Honey Jason to win. I, I mean, I thought he looked really, really good on Ultimate Fighter Brazil. I mean, I followed that season and he did. He was a standout. I know he won the show, but he stood out on the show as well. Uh, but I, as good as the fight was and as much as it was a good TKO, personally, I wouldn't have given that knockout of the night. And, uh, and I'm sure everyone's got their own views on it. But I thought Anderson Silva's knee to the body deserved knockout of the night just because it was such a fantastic strike. But it was still, it was it was a great fight and it you know, Honey Jason is certainly going to be someone to look out for in the future, I think. Yeah, you know, and uh, full disclosure, I, I have to be honest, I, I did not get a chance to see this fight. I've, I got the whole event on DVR, and uh, it's been a tough weekend just, just trying to catch up with this and Bellator. They put on a good card, but uh, I picked Sam Cecilia to win this one uh, just because of it. I, I liked uh, watching Honey Jason on the Ultimate Fighter Brazil. He had a, a good fight at UFC 147 to uh, to win the first ever Tough Brazil Featherweight Championship. Um, 
but I, I thought Sam would would edge it out with uh, his wrestling and and the power and his striking. But uh, when I had heard that Home Jason had won the fight, everybody I talked to said he looked much improved from his time on Tough and uh, even from his UFC 147 fight. So I, I'm definitely glad to hear that that Honey Jason got the win, and uh, I'm I'm very excited to go back and and see this fight. I'm I'm very sad I haven't already. It really surprises me that you actually watched Tough Brazil. Mad props to uh, Sweet Pappy John for watching that uh, yeah, season. Yeah, <laughs> Mike John. Yeah. yeah, that was uh, that was a good season. And, and Hani, you know, it's kind of a showman. He comes out with that that uh, uh, Jason mask, you know, that obviously Hani Jason. And uh, he says that he'll never lose as long as he wears the mask. You know, I love hearing uh, things like that, like, Brandon Vera, I'll never lose. But um, as far as the actual fight itself, uh, Hani looked fantastic. That first round was just crazy. He 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 uh, knocked Sam Cecilia on his ass at one point, and um, Cecilia bounced right back up. They were exchanging uh, just wild shots, and Joe Rogan's like, "This is crazy. They're just incredible. They're going for it. They're going for <laughs> it." And uh, you know, to, just to see the end, he clipped him with a hard shot. Uh, Cecilia fell down, and then Hani followed up with some brutal hammer fists and, uh, you know, put him out. And Cecilia, apparently, according to, I think, John Albert or Hal Shesse, I can't remember, one of our guests said that he was going down to 145. And uh, we're like, oh, who is it? He's like, oh, I don't know. So, um, you know, it was just nice to kind of see Cecilia go down a weight class. I mean, he was kind of a massive lightweight, so it made sense. And um, you can't take too much credit or stock out of Cecilia because, because of the show that he put on, it was a very back and forth fight, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. Definitely, um, yeah. Sam Sam actually landed a pretty good punch right 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 before uh, Jason ended the fight. Uh, put a punch right behind Jason's ear, but uh, then then Jason catches a a body kick and absolutely slugs Sam Cecilia with a counter right. Mario Yamasaki runs in. I loved that that moment, but actually my favorite Honey Jason moment of the entire night was watching the press conference, and and they asked Dana and Anderson Silva what they they thought of women's MMA. Dana gave his his typical, "Oh yeah, we're thinking about it. You know, probably gonna happen sometime down 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 the road." And then Anderson actually says, "Yeah." I don't like it that that much. You know, talks. Uh, I think he said, uh, eh, "Women, women win enough already." You know, making a, a joke. Women, uh, women beat men enough all already. Joking around. You know, says, "No, I don't like." And then puts puts the microphone back down on on the table, and Honey Jason picks it up and just goes, "I like." And puts it back down. <laughs> that was that was the moment of the entire press conference, and actually was the final moment. But looking at Honey Jason uh, moving forward in in the featherweight division, you know I'm I'm really kind of unsure where where to uh, put him. You know this is this is his first test versus a UFC veteran. Obviously, his uh, only other fight in the UFC was at the Ultimate Fighter Brazil finales, where he. Uh, Obviously went on to win. You know, I'm thinking of guys in the UFC who are coming off a win. You know, I I don't necessarily want to see him fight a guy who's up there, like you know, like like a top ten or a top twenty guy. I still want to see him get a couple fights under his belt before he moves into that 145 pound elite. Uh, what do you guys think about him taking on a guy like Nam Fan, who just beat Cole Miller uh, this past August? Yeah, I, I think that fight makes sense. But the, the I mean, I straight away when I saw the fight, I had a fight lined up. I I, I thought I'd like to see because obviously we, I knew we were going to be doing this. I agree, he's not ready for for top twenty yet. I think they should build him up. I think he's a great prospect, uh, and obviously I'd look, like to see him built up. But I I'd like I wouldn't mind seeing him fight Diego Brando. I think that'd be quite an interesting fight. Yeah, that that definitely uh, would be an interesting fight. Another uh, ultimate fire featherweight winner. Um, I think that'd be good. Uh, definitely a tough test for for both fighters. Um, and I'm with you guys in the general sentiment that uh, Pony should be brought along uh, a little more slowly. Um, I'd like to see him. Heck, I could uh, I could see him going against a, a Cody McKenzie. I know McKenzie's coming off a loss. 
Uh, but at the same time, he's a very big featherweight, uh, very tall, rangy, 145. He's got that really good submission game, and uh, his striking has, has come along a little bit. So uh, I, I wouldn't be upset if they if they put a match together similar to that. Chris? Chris? Yes. Um, yes. Um, you know what? I, I think that Nam Fan is probably your best your best bet, a guy that's coming off a one win, um, has had a rocky, uh, rocky road per se in the UFC. You know, he's had some, uh, losses and some wins. So I think that makes sense. Uh, he's a very, very, very tough test for any, any, uh, fighter out there in the division. He's got some excellent boxing, has a wicked jab and a wicked body punch and a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. So I think Nam Fan is perfect. The only other guy, I think that Hani should fight, and I know you guys probably won't agree considering his standing in the division, but I think Diego Nunez coming off a one win. Uh, before that, he came off a loss and hadn't impressed all of us. So I think really putting uh, Nunes in there with a guy who will bring it is uh, kind of an exciting thing considering what Palaszewski did in uh, their fight. Yeah, you know, that that definitely would be a fun fight, but but you know, the uh, UFC is going to protect Honey Jason. He's he's somewhat of an asset to him now. So, you know, maybe we'll see that, you know, after one or two more fights for Honey Jason. But uh yeah, I I actually like all of those stylistic matchups you all proposed. Um and I'm moving on to to the the main card, the uh the fight that started all the fun. God, a brutal neck crank submission victory for Damian Damian Maya uh, halfway through the first round. Story didn't look like he had a chance the entire time. Maya did what he he wanted to do, held Story down, controlled Story's back, and uh, really kind of with a brutal brutal neck crank. Actually, as as he he squeezed the uh, submission, you know, clinched it in. You actually saw blood. Like literally, not not drip, but a just blood squirt out of Story's nose. Um, awesome bloody way to to start off the uh, the main card, which ended up being a really really fun card and really kind of vaults Damian Maya up the welterweight ranks. It absolutely does, and I think that what I can take out of this fight that's the most important thing is that Damian Maya has finally gone back to his grappling roots. I mean, he became a mediocre kickboxer who was in some terribly boring fights. His fights with, uh, let's see here, he fought Dan Miller. That was bad. Um, he's had, you know, so, oh, the Weidman fight was pretty horrible. His fight with Santiago was interesting, but that was mainly grappling. So I feel that over the years, he was kind of transitioning. After getting knocked out by Marquardt, he wanted to become a striker primarily. And what made him magnificent in his initial run was five UFC finishes by submission. All five got submission of the night. That's saying something. Joe Rogan was talking about how he's just absolutely fantastic at welterweight with this kind of grappling. And he proved it. Nobody in the UFC has finished Rick's story. Not a single guy. And he made it look easy. And that's what I take out of it. I can't wait to see him fight again. To me, I mean, this was an absolute fantastic performance by Damian Meyer. I don't know how, how the rest of you guys did on your picks and stuff, but I, I got nine fights right on this one out of the 12. So, I mean, I had a pretty solid event, but this was the only fight I got bang on. I mean, you, you break a fight down in your head. For me, this was always going to be Maya round one submission because Maya's jiu-jitsu is fantastic. Now, I know what Chris was saying about him, you know, coming away from the grappling, but I felt he showed in, in the short fight we had against Dong Kung Kim, he showed us that he went back to grappling because he, he took Kim down. Obviously, Kim got injured. But he, he went straight in for the takedown. So f- right from that fight, I knew that Maya then was back to his grappling. And he showed it in this fight. As soon as he got hold of Rick Story, you know, when he had him down, the fight was over. And Damian Maya looked big at welterweight as well. I honestly think he's going to make waves in this division. I think he's ready for a top 10 guy in this division now. I, I absolutely agree with you guys. Uh, Damian Maya just looked, uh, he, he looked like he really returned back to the form that we saw him in when he first broke into the UFC. And uh, Ray, kind of like you had mentioned, I, I thought he was going to go grappling heavy as well in, in this fight with Rick Story. And really, it just makes sense. Uh, when you look at the kind of competitor that Rick Story is, this is a guy who just has a, a chin of, of pure marble, pure granite. 
Uh, if you go back and watch his Tiago Alves fight, they were both just rocking each other with the most ridiculous hooks and just hitting each other with bricks, and no one was given an inch. I mean, uh, Rick Story, he's the kind of guy that, in my mind, Brazilian jiu-jitsu was invented for a guy like him. He's just a crazy bastard. With You can't knock him out. He's just got too hard of a chin. He he has a great wrestling game. Um, And, and for me, I said, you know what, Damian Maia, He's got to go to his submission game just if he wants to win that fight because that's what you have to do to Rick Story. You you got to choke that guy out or else he's just going to be in your face, uh, just blasting you all night. And um, yeah, it, he looked amazing, amazing in that fight. His uh, the the way he was able to take him down uh, looks really good for him at, at 170. You know, to to be able to take down and, and command a strong wrestler like that and Rick Story. Um, so, yeah, it was just beautiful, a beautiful submission. Um, also, one of the only fights I, I got spot on, I, I got swayed by some hype pretty bad, and it, I was I was very upset at myself for that. Um, but, yeah, it was just a, a fantastic showing. And, yeah, Damian Maya just looks crazy at 170. I, I'd have a hard time picking anybody against him right now. Yeah, I had a great card as well. Um, I actually went 10-2, and two, but unfortunately I picked this as a second-round submission instead of a first-rounder. Um, as far as looking at the futures of both of these guys, um, Story's a good fighter. It's kind of hard hard to, to believe he's 1-3 in his last four fights. I think a pretty compelling matchup for him would be Story versus Eric Silva, another guy on the same card who, who showed a, a weakness in wrestling. So for Story, it would be a good chance to redeem himself against the guy who's shown a couple holes in his game when he fought John Fitch. And for Eric Silva, it would be a good way to work on his wrestling, kind of redeem himself against Story, who isn't near the wrestler that John Fitch is at. As far as Damian Maya, um, I forget which one of you said it, but I completely agree he's in the top ten of Walter Waits now. And, Maybe. and you know, that's, that's, that's such a clogged up... Uh, division, you know, most of these guys are are scheduled in fights with each other. You have Condit GSP, Hendricks Campman, McDonald Penn. Um, just just thinking of of guys who still, you know, have have a uh, open a uh, opening as far as their next fight goes. I'm not sure what Josh Koscheck is looking like with his injury. Maybe if he he can get back in the ring. In the next five six months, I'd I'd love to to see Maya versus uh, Koscheck. Hey, yeah, another guy who actually hasn't fought since earlier this year. I don't know why he hasn't been plugged into any fights recently. But C R Bahadurzada, that would be a real interesting fight. Hey, a guy in C R who can land some bombs against Maya. Who I'm, you know, Chris. I uh, really agree. I'm I'm very very pleased. He's he's returned to to the ground where really he uh, belongs. You know, it was. It was a valiant effort to try and work on his stand-up game, but Damian Maya is one of the best grapplers probably all time in UFC history. So seeing him get back to to those strong jujitsu roots is uh, definitely a a good thing for him. A good thing, and on top of that, um, as far as next opponents, I have a very compelling matchup. Another guy who is one and zero in the welterweight division. How about a rematch with Nate Marquardt? Bring over the Strike Force champ. Uh, they're at a different weight class, and I think it would just be um, the perfect storyline for Maya to avenge that one crushing loss that he had. Anderson Silva didn't even finish Damian Maya, and I know he was kind of messing around that fight, but Nate Marquardt absolutely trucked him. So to have that rematch, I think it would be perfect. It's a high profile fight, you know, a borderline top 10. I think that would be uh, absolutely perfect in my book. He punched him so hard, he actually did a 180 in the air. That was an awesome. One of my favorite knockouts of all time. I like that fight as well. I think uh, I think that would be a, a good fight for, Dam- for Damian Maya. Uh, for Rick Story, I'd like to see him given somebody, maybe he can get a win and start building himself up again. And I'm not saying he's not capable of beating Eric Silva, but I would drop him down the ladder and, and get him at least one more win and then bring him back up again. But I'd like maybe uh, and a good fight for him would be Jay Heron. Because I think it, it, he was he is somebody that Story would be a competitive fight, but Story could beat. Uh, and if I could pick a, an opponent for Damian Maya, I mean, I, I like the Nate Marquardt fight, but I'd say chuck him in with John Fitch, two of the best grapplers in in the welterweight division. Yeah, very Damn, good match. 
yeah, good matchups all the way around, guys. Um, you know, as far as Damian Maya goes, uh, Fitch and Maya, that does seem to be a, a really good consensus match. I know there's been a lot of buzz uh, surrounding the, that potential matchup following UFC 153. I could absolutely get on board with that. I could get on board with, like I said, any of the fights you guys mentioned. Uh, Maya versus CR, that would be awesome. Uh, Maya versus Marquardt, the rematch, you know, great storylines. There's a million ways to paint that one. Um, you know, and if, if none of those came to fruition, I'd like to see him, uh, perhaps against a Nick Diaz, Nick Diaz. He was very, very high in the welterweight ladder, uh, before his, his, in some, including my eyes, uh, controversial decision loss to Carlos Condit. I mean, he was, he was knocking on the door of that title shot. Um, a lot of people thought he won the Condit fight. I certainly did. Um, so I'd like to see the two of them uh, go against each other. Uh, Diaz is, is very good on the ground. Uh, whether or not he's Damian Maya level, you know, that's uh, absolutely up for debate. Um, Diaz would have the striking edge, and uh, I think that would just be an exciting matchup no matter which way it goes. Um, as far as Rick's story, um, I, I could get on board seeing him take on uh, – Perhaps Aaron Simpson. Aaron Simpson, he's just coming off a loss, but uh, he's 1-1 one one at welterweight right now. Uh, did look good in his loss uh, against Mike Pierce. Um, but I, I think that'd be a, an exciting matchup and a, a good test for both fighters. Yeah, um, I uh, don't want to sound like a broken record, but just, just like the jason Cecilia fight, I like all all those matchups as uh, well. I I actually hadn't thought of Maya versus Fitch, but that would be be really interesting, kind of Hughes, Hughes Gracie-esque. You got a top wrestler versus a top jiu-jitsu guy, but in this uh, case, you know, whereas Hughes was much, much stronger than Hoist Gracie, I don't know if Fitch, know, Fitch, 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 um, I'm hearing uh, an echo a little bit. Patrick. Patrick. Chris. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but uh, with a Fitch Maya rematch, or I guess it would be a rematch, but with Fitch versus Maya, um, I don't think Fitch would necessarily have have that similar strength advantage. So we'll uh, move on. Speaking of strength advantage, uh, one of the strongest light heavyweights in in the UFC, we had Phil Davis versus Wagner Prado. And the first fight, obviously, at UFC on Fox 3, where the fight was unfortunately ended with an eye poke, which I thought was pretty funny at, at the weigh-ins, both of them kind of reenacting a, a, a eye poke there. You know, both of them seem like very, very nice guys. Uh, Phil, Phil would not, you know, the uh, eye poke took, took place standing last time, and Phil did not want this fight to be standing up uh, the first round. Pretty much the entire round, or not uh, the entire round, I, I I think the first minute or two was standing, but after that first minute or two of, of the fight, Phil realized that he could take Wagner Prado down at will, whenever he wanted, to shoot for a double, and slam him down, ragdoll him down, keep him down, won the first fight, or the first round, 10-9, even with the cascade of boos coming from the crowd. Second round, more of the... The same, uh, Davis was pressing in, Prado was trying to jump out, and he just got taken down, taken down, and then actually toward the end of the second round, uh, Prado tries to twist loose and, and stand up, and as, as this transition's kind of taking place, Davis grabs hold of a tight, tight anaconda choke, (laughs) tight anaconda chalk, uh, Tack, 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 tight anaconda choke and uh, rolls Prado to get the submission victory, which uh, yeah, you know the uh, Brazilian fans weren't aren't aren't necessarily you know happy when they see an American beat a Brazilian. But as far as straight jujitsu technique, that was a really really pretty ana- anaconda choke and sort of like Ray and Patrick, you all were talking about about the Maya fight being one of the only ones that they guessed perfectly. This actually was my only fight that I guessed perfectly. I had Phil Davis second round submission. Um, yeah, he has he has some really 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 uh good technique which mixed up with with that that strength you know as davis gets older he's he is going to be year in and year out a challenger for that 205 belt yeah he really is and he looked like a uh like the solid prospect we we expected him to be coming in 
Um, he was very hesitant in the first fight against Wagner Prado. Uh, made me kind of kind of nervous as to how this fight would play out. Um, I was thinking of going second round submission as well, just because of that uh, that hesitance in the first fight. For whatever reason, I took first round submission. That's all right though. You know, I'll I'll take it. Um, but it really did look good. I thought uh, I thought Davis looked a lot better standing. He looked more comfortable while it was on the feet. Um, than he did in, in the first, you know, if, if you could even call their first matchup a fight. Um, he looked a lot better in that respect. And then, uh, like you said, Jake, as soon as he, he got through that feeling out process, he said, hey, you know what, I can take this guy and just basically twist him up like a pretzel. And, uh, and that's basically what he did. Um, he was just phenomenal on the ground. Um, he, he stayed heavy with it and um, – Gosh, that that anaconda choke, that was really a thing of beauty. I mean, there's there's been a couple good anaconda chokes over the years, but this was was certainly one of the more impressive ones. I mean, Davis just ragdolled him to the ground, and, and Prado is a huge light heavyweight. He looks like a really big 205, and Davis just, just said, nah, son, I'm, I'm choking you out. He threw him to the ground. He slapped it on, and, and that it was so tight. Um it was very beautiful. I, I definitely think either that or the Damian Maya fight probably should have gotten submission of the night. Good call, my friend. Good call. Submission of the night candidate and the beautifully uh, executed anaconda choke. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys something real quick before I break it down. Is it just me or does Phil Davis, when he's striking, look like he's on roller skates? Every time the guy throws a strike, he (laughs) slides around left or right. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but it doesn't seem good for him. I don't know if he has oily feet. I'm not racist. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Chris, Chris, god damn it. But uh, do you guys, have you guys noticed that? I haven't noticed it. I'll look out for it now, though. Yeah, when he fought Rashad, I saw it all the time. He would throw uh, a front kick or a punch, and then he would off-center himself and just kind of slide around. It's the strangest thing. So, whatever. Since you guys didn't notice that, I'll just move on to my <laughs> breakdown. Um, he he looked absolutely great. Um, the only issue that I have with this fight is that it was Wagner Prado. Yes, he had eight finishes in the first round or second round by knockout against a bunch of guys in Brazil. That's very commendable. But um, Phil Davis was pretty close to fighting for a title when he fought uh, Rashad Evans, and he got dominated in that fight and bad. And then he went up against a Brazilian striker and looked great, got a beautiful finish. I loved his setups. He tried to get that arm triangle choke. Uh, then uh, went back to mount, and then uh, off of a sprawl, got that anaconda. I loved it. It was beautiful. But I really don't think that we've learned anything from Phil Davis after this fight. Uh, He fought a no-ranked guy who's nowhere near the top 25, and he dominated him. So I think uh, it kind of made more questions than it answered, I guess, in this fight. I know know exactly where you're coming from. It's always a risk, though, because we've seen seen people go against no-ranked guys before, and it's backfired. And the one that jumps out automatically is for Vich- for Richard Vadum when he faced you know Junior De Santos. No one knew who Junior De Santos was. Obviously, no everyone knows who he is now. So it's always a risk. You can never underestimate. Even when Josh Koscheck faced Paolo Thiago, another one that which was a you know a, a nothing to gain fight, and he obviously got knocked out. But I mean, Phil Davis had to go out there and do a job, and there was obviously a lot of with the way the first fight ended, it kind of made this fight more important, I think, and more people were interested because of what happened in the first fight, and everyone felt that. For that short time that fight happened, Wagner Prado shown quite a lot on the feet, and he could have been a danger. But Phil Davis was was brilliant. He got in there. He you know he got the takedown. He he looked in control. And the transition because obviously he went for the arm triangle choke, and, and Wagner Prado rolled out, which was brilliant. But the transition to the anaconda choke was was just was just a thing of beauty. Just, the setup was brilliant. I personally felt that this submission should have won submission of the night. As good as the neck crank was. Uh, I mean, there's no way the armbar should have won it personally, but as good as the neck crank was, I thought this one should have won submission of the night. Um, I actually think uh, Big Nog won one submission of of the yeah night. the, um, the armbar. I don't know how yeah. that won it. That's what I was saying. He shouldn't have won it. I oh, thought yeah, yeah. I thought this one should have won. I don't think an armbar should have won over an anaconda choke personally. Yeah, I think one of the main reasons that that Nog kind of took precedence over Davis was just the simple fact that. 
Nog is a Brazilian, and yeah, and Davis is an American, and they're so uber nationalistic over in Brazil. Oh, how could you tell? <laughs> yeah, um, even uh, Dana White mentioned at at the on or the uh, end of UFC 153 at the post fight press conference. He he uh, mentioned like, yeah, I realize Brazilians don't like to see Brazilians fight Brazilians. Brazilians, Brazilians like to see. Brazilians fight people from Brazilians other countries. From other countries. Patrick, um, Patrick, Patrick, you gotta, you gotta Patrick. work on that shit, son. Reverb, reverb, reverb. Dude. reverb. Oh, um, oh no. Yeah, um, you know, I, I was actually kind of curious. I, I think the the UFC has done four shows in Rio, or not a Rio, but four shows in in Brazil since bringing it over there at UFC 134. And I looked, and there's actually only been one fight out of all four cards. That didn't feature a a Brazilian fighter, and I think it was Eve Edwards against someone else. I uh, got to double check that, but uh, yeah, you know, you uh, see a lot of Brazilian fighters there, and I kind of think Nog got got a little bit of uh, credit just just because he's you know such a legend. Um, but but looking at both of these these guys' futures, um, Prado, you know, no one really jumps jumps in in my mind because I don't really you know yeah. Prado's good. He'll probably have a future in the UFC, but I don't even think of him as top 20, top 30 in the UFC's light heavyweight division, which traditionally has been one of their most stacked divisions. So, you know, I'm thinking of guys who will stand with him and are coming off a loss. Maybe a guy like Kingsbury. Um, You know, that would probably be an interesting fight. As far as Davis goes... You know he's he's actually fought a lot of the the contenders at 205. He's fought Little Nog, beat him. Fought Gustafson, beat him. Lost to Rashad Evans. You know a another young guy who's also wrestling based like Davis. It would be pretty interesting to see Ryan Bader take him on. Um, Bader coming off that loss against Leona Machida a couple months ago, and I know how how uh, the UFC doesn't like to put guys who just won against guys who just lost. But you know, sort of like welterweight, a lot of these these guys are, you know, gonna have their uh, future fights are are taken up. We have uh, Henderson Machida. Uh, he wouldn't fight Evans. You have Hua versus Gustafson. Quentin Jackson's probably gonna take on Glover Teixeira next. Um, Griffin Sonnen. So yeah, I would I would personally like to see Phil Davis take on uh, Bader, who's only a year older than him. Uh, both of them young. Davis 28, Bader 29. That would be a good good test of the young athletic wrestlers at 205. Patrick? P money. Well, it looks like P money might not be with us. So until he gets back, uh, what do you think, Chris? Well, I think that's fantastic. Bader is a, a good call. Uh, you're talking about Bader and Davis, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, definitely. Uh, two two wrestlers. Bader obviously has more knockout power than um, than uh, Davis does, but Davis has that grappling, you know, strength and just. It's not that he's necessarily uber strong. He does have an awesome build. He definitely has strength. I don't think he's stronger than Bader, but what Davis has is perfect technique. He showed that in the second Prado fight where he was always in perfect position. So I think that's a very intriguing matchup. Um, I like that a lot. Perfect technique and oily feet. Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, hey, it's nothing racist. But uh, anyways, (laughs) so I think uh, that's a great matchup. Um, You know what? As much as this makes absolutely zero sense considering that uh, I think Bader's coming off of a loss, so I don't think he should be matched up with Davis. I would like to see him versus uh, James Tahunhun. I know that's not really on Davis's level, but I think that would be a very compelling fight. It's a guy who doesn't have you know a super good ground game, but he has awesome defensive wrestling and one punch knockout power. I think uh, I like that fight. I also like the Bader fight. Um, what do you think, Ray? That would that would still still be a step up from. Uh... From fighting, uh, wow, Prado, Jesus, Prado. Prado. Jesus Pro- Christ, Prado. great pod, everybody. Um, actually, I think Patrick's back, so let's throw the ball into his court. Uh, are you back with us, friend? Uh, I am back. You know, I, I had to regain my composure. I was so upset you stole my my Ryan Bader matchup. I just said, "Fuck this! I'm done with this podcast." I hung up the phone. I was I was getting uh, Terrell Owens with it. Just uh, 
Dang, T.O. T.O. I was, I was getting prima donna-ish. But, um, no, you know what? Uh, you guys have, have some good matchups there. Um, I, I think Tahuna, that's just a good style matchup. Um, I was leaning more towards Bader myself just because, um, you know, after the win over Wagner Prado, you got to step it up, obviously. Um, and Ryan Bader, in spite of coming off a loss, that loss is to Leota Machida. And really the only losses in, in his career, um, you know, Leota Machida, John Jones, um, I mean, of course, to, to be the one person Tito Ortiz broke his losing streak against, that, that's that got to hurt. But, I mean, realistically speaking, Tito Ortiz, he, he's a legend in the game. So, you know, a loss to him isn't, you know, it isn't so terrible. Um, but, you know, all of his losses are to top competition. Um, he does, he has a really solid skill set. Um, I, I like that fight for, for Phil Davis. And as for Wagner Prado, um, you know, I think he, he'll he probably get hooked up with another card or uh, another fight, perhaps another Brazil card. Um, you know, perhaps taking on another unranked opponent, you know, maybe a, a Geronimo Dos Santos, um, so someone along those lines. Or, you know, perhaps they'll, they'll bring in a prospect from outside of the organization and uh, try and set old Wagner up with a win. So um, definitely uh, it'll be interesting to see where they go with that, but... Yeah, Phil Davis, he he absolutely has to take a step up in competition. And um yeah, I, I think uh I think Ryan Bader would, would be a good place to go. I think if it was up to me, I'd uh, scrap the Glover Teixeira and Rampage Jackson fight because who really wants to see a half hearted Rampage Jackson in the octagon unless it's to get battered? I'd rather see uh two top contenders go at it, two people who are real prospects and who really want to be there and who are real future guys who could fight for the title. I think Phil Davis versus Glover Teixeira would be, a, would be a great fight, personally. I'd rather see that fight, I think, than Ryan Bader. But that's just my own opinion. As for um, uh, Wagner Prado, I don't know how far he's going to go. I mean, obviously, he, he wants someone that's going to stand with him. You know, Phil Davis completely outgrappled him. But a lot of the guys that come out of that fight that are not in America always struggle against wrestlers anyway. But if he's once one that stands with him, I think they should feed him to Jimmy Manoa. Let Jimmy Manoa make get another uh, an impressive TKO on on uh, a second impressive TKO in the UFC. That's what I'd like to see. Ooh, I like that one as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, it seems like Page is, has been sort of uh, not not really uh, not not really there when it comes to being motivated for a fight. But but he's I don't know he he and Glover have been jawing back and forth eh, a little bit so you know I'm I'm really hoping it'll be be a sort of win win situation either Rampage somehow musters up a win against Glover or Glover uh, knocks Rampage out of the 205 elite something that I'm kind of surprised hasn't happened yet. But, um, yeah, the next fight we'll get to is John Fitch versus Eric Silva. But I think, Ray, you uh, dug up some tweets. So let us get to guess that tweet. Woo! Oh, yeah. Right, are we ready then, kids? Let's do it. Okay. I've got, Wait, I've, I've got five tweets for you. Right, so we'll Woo! start with tweets. And this time, Stop. MMA Podcast is going to whoop MMA Mental's ass. You're going down. Ooh. Patrick, no press, but if you lose, you're off the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't I, like I would deserve it. I would deserve right. it. Right. Tweet number one. When teaching jiu-jitsu, I refer to every move I don't know as the switcheroo. That's 90% of the moves in jiu-jitsu that I called that. <laughs> is it uh, Michael Chandler... Marcus Johnson, Gunnar Nelson, or Phil DeFries? Oh, wow. That is a that is just a tough one. You're Can throwing you up the again? serves already. Real quick. Got, got the names again? Yeah, names again. Sorry. Right. Michael Chandler, Demarcus Johnson, Gunnar Nelson, or Phil DeFries? All right. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You know, I want to say Demarcus Johnson just because I feel he's got that sense of humor. Uh, I'll roll the dice and say Michael Chandler, though. Ooh, I like. I uh, thought about picking Chandler. You know, I'm I'm simply gonna pick Gunnar Nelson because I think Ray has a little bit of a European bias, and I know Nelson's a black belt in jujitsu, so I will officially pick Gunnar Nelson. Chris, 
I like uh, the Gunnar Nelson pick, but here's the issue with Chandler and Nelson. They're both really fucking boring guys who I don't think could come up with that on their own. So I'm going to go ahead and say Philip DeFries. And the right answer is Phil DeFries. Oh, uh, all right. That's right. We taking over. <laughs> so you were right with the European, uh, Jake, but you get Damn zero it. points still. So well done. So close yet so far. <laughs> right. Second to eight. Trust me, I don't want to be a legend. That means I'm old. Is it M- Matt Hughes, Frank Shamrock, Frank Trigg, or Josh Barnett? Patrick? Ooh, gosh, you uh, you were just looking to stump us today. Uh, can we get that list just one more time? Yeah. Matt Hughes, Frank Shamrock, Frank Trigg, or Josh Barnett? Okay, you know, uh, I'm going with Barnett in this one. I think, uh, you know, especially Matt and Frank, they've probably been referred to as legends a bunch, and uh, I, I could see Josh saying something like that. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, simply going with Josh because, uh, Chris, you had some Josh. pretty good Josh Barnett. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> last tweet, Chris, um, you actually had, had a good point that... Uh, that a, a couple of those guys just don't have have the humor to say something like that. And Josh is is a pretty funny guy, pretty outspoken guy. So I'm going to go with Josh Barnett, too. Yeah, Trigg is going through that horrible thing. He's kind of staying out of the media. I'm, I'm going against uh, Trigg. Matt Hughes probably doesn't even know how to work Twitter other than, hey, check out uh, this deer I killed. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and say Josh Barnett as well. Okay, the right answer is Frank Trigg. Oh! Wow! Oh man! Damn it! Throwing us the curves. Jesus there Christ! There you go. Right, number three. To beat black guys, I distract them with chubby white girls before the fight. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh god. The possibilities: Marcus Brimage, Nam Fan, Dean Thomas, Rampage Jackson. Oh my god! <laughs> this is it. Okay, this is not a racist can show. Can I just read that? Can I just read that tweet out again? Because it was so good. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, please, you may. <laughs> to beat to beat black guys, I distract them with chubby white girls before the fight. Oh my god! And uh, what were the four nominees again? Marcus Brimage, Nam Fan, Dean Thomas, Rampage Jackson. Oh man! You know, I, I want to say it's ankle titties. Uh, just because, you know, that's kind of familiar subject matter for him. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm gonna go with, um, I'm gonna go with Dean Thomas, though. He, uh, he seemed like a pretty funny guy when we, we got to interview him. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll roll the dice on Dean. I actually heard when, uh, you all had Dean on, on, uh, MMA Mental. That was a great interview. So, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll stick with Patrick like I did last question. Um, I'm uh, hope, I'm hoping there's <laughs> there's a little bit of bias in there, MMA mentalist bias. Um, I was actually, you know, I uh, didn't think there would be many black guys in in the nominees, but three of the four were. So <laughs> yeah, screw it, Dean Thomas. All right, I'm going to go against the Tove here and say that it's definitely Marcus Brimage. I think he's funnier than Rampage. Rampage isn't active on Twitter. Dean Thomas is a safe bet, but uh, my money is on the, uh, the what is his name, the Alabama Stallion or some shit. I'll go with that guy. The Bama right. Beast. The right answer, Dean Thomas. No! Oh, 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 oh. Oh. So, so yeah, we all have one point. point now, huh? Yeah. We're all tied up at one. one. Okay, we've got two more tweets. We need to cut his throat. (sighs) I'm going to kill you, Patrick. Right. Oh, I'm going to kill you. Number four. Rehab before surgery, six to nine months for a full recovery, they're saying. Damn. Possibilities. Dwayne uh, Dwayne Ludwig, Gerard Haman, John Jones, Brandon Vera. Ooh. Gosh, yeah, another tough question. All what were the first two again? Sorry. Sorry, I'll read it. I'll read it all again. Rehab before surgery, six to nine months for a full recovery, they're saying. Damn. 
Dwayne Ludwig, Gerard Herman, John Jones, Brandon Vera. Gosh, that is, that is just a tough one. Um, I I will go with, and I'm just thinking and thinking of their fights in my head, thinking of the severity of injuries. Um, I'll go with Jared Hammond on this one. All right, good. I was really hoping you weren't going to pick Dwayne Ludwig because if you were, that would have meant three straight picks where I rode on on your coattails. Um, I'm ruling out John Jones just just because I feel like I would have heard about this if it was Jones. Dwayne, there would have been uh, a God reference. Yeah, you know, it it uh, probably would have started off with the phrase "I feel as if." Um, yeah, fuck it, Dwayne Ludwig. I'm also going Ludwig. Makes the most sense um, after that injury. So, uh, shit. We, we may be rolling no dice here, but I'm going with Jake. Please don't right. be Hammond. Goddamn. The right answer is J- Dwayne Ludwig. Yeah! Suck it. Suck it. Suck oh. it. I really hope that you have a sixth uh, uh, sudden death round tweet, Ray. I haven't. I've got five tweets. Oh, you son of a bitch. Oh, I oh, know. I'm a bad man. Oh, this, this one right, what I'm going to do for this one, I'm going to chop it up. I'm going to make I'm going to make Patrick go last so you can't copy him. So, Patrick, you guess, guess last on this one. Wait, what? You can't I, I, do I, that. I'm, I'm, I'm hosting. I'm hosting. I'll do what I pretty well want. <laughs> Don't like it. Just, you can write a letter of complaint and then it'll be dealt with within the next 40 Oh, weeks. sure it will. Do I have right. to <laughs> use extra postage to send it to the UK? Just send As it to so. I'm sure it'll get, I'll get it. <laughs> right, num- number five. Um, Jake, you're up first. I'm always the second fastest driver on the road. That way, if there's a speed trap, the other asshole gets caught and I cruise on through. Okay. Possibilities. Sam Cecilia, Joey Proctor, Darren Crookshank, James Vick. Darren Crookshank. Well, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm, I'm thinking. Chris, give, give me the, the options. I know these are all guys from the same fucking season. Who is it again? Yeah. Sam Cecilia, Joey Proctor, Darren Crookshank, James Vick. Well, Proctor's boring. Vick is weird. Crookshank makes sense. I'm going to go with... Uh... Shit, I'm going Joe Proctor. Hot trick. Oh, man. You know what? And I swear to God, I... I, I'm not on the Twitter feed that much, but I know I saw this tweet. Uh, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's you know, yeah, weird. You know, son of a bitch. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you know, I I've, I've got to go with Aaron Crookshank. I know uh, it's an exercise of futility in this one, but uh, I believe he's the right call. Hey, it's Darren Crookshank. I think no, no. no. Yep, I uh, we were tied up going into that, Chris. So it looks like y'all got a new champion, my fucker. Woo! Oh, M- MMA podcast well with the victory. Eat it, eat it, eat our poop. <laughs> Two one, you all still still have have uh, the advantage. It's actually funny you say eat our poop because I'm pretty sure I was pooping when I read that that one tweet in in particular. Um, yeah, Crookshank. <laughs> If uh, you all aren't following Darren Crookshank on on Twitter, you are missing out because he's usually tweeting about you know something joke related or zombie related. He's heavy on the zombie tweets. So, Jake, well done. Well, well I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't quite the blow up. Yeah, no, first, let's have a gentleman's cigarette. What do you say, you guys? <laughs> first off, yeah, I would yeah, like to yeah. thank God. I'd also like to thank my beautiful mother. Um, I'd like to, 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 me. to thank my testicle moisturizer. I'd like don't to forget about thank, me. Don't forget about me. I'd like to. Uh, who else? I can't think of anybody. Uh, oh, my beautiful, stunningly gorgeous co-host Christopher Lowe. Without five your foot eight, one eighty-five, five eight, one eighty-five, built like a brick <laughs> shit house, so girthy. <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah i uh wow it would it would be pretty funny i i guess patrick hosts next week in our little rotating hosting gig we do so if chris wins next week everyone will have one victory after one full go around on guess that tweet 
And if Chris, Chris loses, unfortunately... that one's win apart from Chris. Everyone yeah. wins when Chris loses. <laughs> yeah, you know basically. what? I can see that happening. I'm so cocky and confident that uh, it plays against me. I could see that happening. Yeah, you know, I I believe if you haven't changed it, the first couple words of your uh, Twitty, Twitter bio is cocky and confident, brash, and some other shit. No, no, I, no it's witty and sensual, sarcastic, and often crass. <laughs> And I only remember that because one of the first times we ever chatted was on MMA at work where I read that live. <laughs> and you're like, ah, I don't even know what to make of this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, good show, gentlemen. And we'll bring you the bonehead of the week after we break down another couple fights. Um, but let's get back into those breakdowns. We had the fight of the night, welterweight John Fitch versus Eric Silva. If you would have told me that the John Fitch fight would go to a decision and he would win it my my you know gut response would be great you know Fitch being a wet blanket I may as well bust out the pillow and blanket and take a little 15 minute nap during the Fitch Silva fight it was actually much more back and forth than the unanimous decision moniker would let you know Um, I actually had Silva winning the second round and and Fitch looked excellent. You know, Silva was not just just lying there. He was, you know, yes, he he was held down during a couple important exchanges, but there were a couple times where he was able to to scramble up. All of us thought Eric Silva would have a vast vast striking advantage against John Fitch, and John Fitch didn't look bad standing up with Eric Silva. Um, the only fight on the main card that went to a unanimous decision goes 30-27 and 29-28 to the last two judges. Fight of the night, uh, Fitch apparently needed this money. He was talking beforehand about, you know, oh, well, I might need to go back to work in a regular job if I don't win this one. And I've I've been a Fitch hater since I really got into to MMA and knew who was who because, you know, as... You know, two, three, four years back, he's been notorious for boring decision after boring uh, decision. This was an incredibly exciting fight. Cristobal? Oh, shit. That's my turn. My bad, guys. Um, God, it's happened like three times in the show. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> but we're replacing that tweet. <laughs> uh, uh, it's probably going to be some other dummy. Uh, <laughs> so, ultimately, this fight... Uh, delivered in spades when John Fitch declared that he would be fighting for fight of the night. To me, that's like the Pope saying he's Jewish. I mean, come on, son. <laughs> let's let's get real here. The guy has barely ever been in fight of the night. I think uh, him versus GSP was fight of the night, but that was just for the fact that he got a whooping. Um, I've always thought that he's extremely skilled, but a guy who wouldn't actually go in there and finish fights. You know, he has that wet blanket moniker, but. Uh, come fight night, John Fitch came to fight. He was a man on fire. That first round, oh my God, we're, t- we're talking John Fitch getting rocked, coming back, wrestling Eric Silva. Eric Silva gets that, uh, back position, you know, back control, gets that choke in, it's in deep. And then John Fitch lives up to that, uh, unchokable moniker and comes back, positions out and, uh, gets a arm bar at the end of the, uh, first round. And then rounds two and three were absolute shutouts for John Fitch. Um, in that third round, I was watching it with a friend of mine, a couple friends, and me, me and my buddy uh, Corey, shout out to Corey, we were watching it and we're like, stop the fight! Shut stop the fight! When uh, John Fitch was in full mount and raining those punches down, any other ref in the business, I think, probably would have stopped it. I, I really, really feel that they would have stopped it. The fact that it was in Brazil, I think, played a lot into that stoppage, uh, or non-stoppage. I really felt that that could have been stopped a long time ago. Um, much respect to Eric Silva for taking that beating and getting up at the end of the fight and walking around. Um, you know, he looked very dejected. And there was actually a point at the end where they announced the fight. After they announced it, Fitch, you know, did his war cry, looked at Silva, walked up to him to give him a hug around the waist, and Eric Silva, like, kind of flinched. <laughs> like he was No, like, please! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like he didn't want anymore. It was, uh, it was a... Fantastic fight, definitely deserving a fight of the night. That was the best John Fitch fight I've ever seen, and I think Eric Silva will come back stronger, much like Rory McDonald did um, after his fight with Carlos Condit. Yes, it was an absolutely amazing fight. Uh, the, the, I mean, I, I, I thought I thought the reunited choke was in round two. I might be wrong, 
But I felt that John Fitch won the first round. Again, it was very much, both first two rounds were very back and forth. I felt Fitch won the first, and I felt that, uh, like Jake, that Eric, uh, Eric Silver took the second. When he had him in the choke, because I'd gone for Silver to win by submission, I was screaming at the telly for him to tap. And obviously, it wasn't it wasn't coming. He wasn't tapping. And the way he fought out of that choke was just amazing, because it looked like it was in, and that was it. It was done and dusted. And there used to be a time when, if you were in the rear naked choke, that was the end of the fight, but that's obviously not the case anymore. But it was just amazing. And I think, in obviously, towards the end of round two, and then on, obviously round three onwards, Silver was visibly gassed uh, and Fitch just took over and, you know, did what Fitch did. But for me, both fighters, uh, yeah, I agree about fight of the night. They both deserve, it definitely deserve fight of the night. It was an amazing fight. But for me, both fighters raised uh, raised their stock that night. Uh, John Fitch for coming out and winning in the way he did against a, a very, very big prospect. And like you say, he didn't just blanket him. It was an exciting win. He tried to finish the fight. I agree. I could see it being stopped towards the end as well because Silver was... I mean, Silver was trying, but he was knackered and he was getting battered. But even though Silver lost that fight, it, it was again he put on a good fight. He was he was always he was always in the fight up until and he obviously struggled in the third round. But he never he never just rolled over. He always tried to keep moving. And the armbar escape as well was unbelievable because he looked knackered at that stage. And when he got out of that armbar, that was very impressive. But yeah, so even though Silver loses for me, he, he goes up in stock for me in my opinion. Yeah, and I, I could definitely see uh, see the case for that. I mean, uh, Eric Silva, he he definitely proved that he he can hang with the upper echelon. Uh, the the second round, I think, was probably if I were to give one round to Eric Silva, I would say it would be the second round. Um, he he did look good. He, you know, he was never out of that fight. Um, for me, the big question was, you know, I, I thought going into that fight that Eric Silva um, had a striking advantage. I thought he would have a potential submission advantage. Um, I, I liked him more as the more well-rounded fighter. Um, and, and sadly, I, I had initially picked Fitch, but I don't know why, but I, I switched it to Silva. I just thought maybe since they were in Brazil, um, there would be more quick stand-ups. But because of John Fitch's work rate, there, there really wasn't many stand-ups. I mean, when John Fitch got him down, uh, he, he was putting in some serious work. You know, He was trying to pass guard. He was raining down lots of good ground and pound. And um, like Jake, I believe you had mentioned to, to start off, um, you know, even on the feet, he didn't look, uh, didn't really look outclassed by Eric Silva. He did pretty good on the feet himself. Um, so it, it was just a great performance by John Fitch. And for me, really, um, you know, my, my whole thing going into this fight was, well, Eric Silva, he's a good, he's a good prospect, but he couldn't fight off Charlie Brandeman's takedowns. And then he was stepping up to face John Fitch. So, um, again, I don't know why I, I, I went away from Fitch um, just because I, I had thought that this was going to be the way it was going to go. But, um, you know, I think Fitch, even if any of us had picked Fitch to win by unanimous decision, I don't think we could have imagined it being as exciting as it was. And, um, you know, Chris, like you had mentioned, uh, Eric Silva, that that fight very well could have been waved off in the third round. Um you know, uh, the, the whole Brazil factor, you know, that, that certainly could have played a part. Uh, but he certainly was. He was doing his damnedest to finish that fight. And he was raining down some great ground and pound. Um, it, it was just a, a great showing from John Fitch. And, um, you know, really served to remind everybody, uh, fans and, and fellow 170-pounders of the UFC alike, uh, like he's a, a perennial uh, top two in the UFC welterweight division. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's he's starting to work his way back up there too. You know, he was at number two for so long, wanted a title shot for so long. Probably would have gotten one if it wasn't for uh, Johnny Hendricks knocking him out. And as far as both of these guys going forward, you know, I originally put out there maybe fighting Koscheck or Cr for Damian Maya. Um, but whoever threw out Fitch Maya, I really like that fight, so why not have the losers and the winners fight each other from the Fitch Silva and the Maya story fight? Have Eric Silva take on story, uh, neither of them really came out of the fight with, with too, too bad of, of injuries, um, obviously story was spewing blood out of his nose, that's never a good thing, but it isn't necessarily something that's gonna take a lot of time to recover from. Fitch and Maya are both in pretty good shape too. Uh, yeah, let's let's match up Fitch and Maya and Sylvan Story and see what happens. Well, I'd love 
I love that breakdown, Jake. That's fantastic. You got the losers fighting each other. It makes sense. Um, you have uh, a Brazilian guy who has awesome jiu-jitsu and striking, and then you have a, a real gritty wrestler in Rick Story. That's a compelling matchup. Then you have Damian Maya, a guy who has looked untouchable at 170. That would be a great test against John Fitch. I have maybe one other possibility that makes sense at this point. You had mentioned earlier that most people at 170 are uh, lined up for fights. So how about uh, John Fitch versus the winner of Rory McDonald and BJ Penn? Uh, obviously, if BJ wins, and, and impressively, it can't be just a, a tepid affair, if BJ wins impressively, that's awesome because they went to a draw. He can finally get that loss off of his record. BJ can prove that he's meant to be there. And if McDonald wins impressively, then he's going up against another top prospect, which I like. I love that because John Fitch has faced mainly in his career. He's faced veterans when he went against, uh, you know, Saunders and Alves and Pierce. All these guys are just really seasoned guys. And McDonald still needs that stern test. He's going to get it when he faces BJ Penn in December. But I think that McDonald Fitch is just as compelling as uh, Fitch Penn too, as well as Fitch versus Maya. For matchups for this, it was me earlier on who said about uh, Fitch and Maya. I, I put that fight forward. And I really like that fight. I think I think it makes sense. I think the the two. Of the, you know, quite possibly two of the best grapplers in the division for different reasons, one with wrestling, one with jiu-jitsu, and I think that would be a, a fantastic fight. Uh, as, as regards to Eric Silva, I'm, I'm not keen on the Story Silva fight because I just think Story deserves, I said earlier on, I think Story needs to step down, get himself a win, build himself back up, so I wouldn't put Story in with Silva. Uh, Silva, for, for someone to come in, I'll maybe put him against one who's going to strike with him, just throwing a name out there, but I wouldn't mind seeing him fight Dan Hardy, I think that would be a good fight. Yeah, I uh, I definitely agree. I think that that fight would be fireworks, and uh, certainly you would think that'd be a fight with uh, you know someone who'd be willing to uh, oblige Eric Silva standing up. Um, and, and really, there's just gosh, there, there's really so many great matchups to make with this one. Um, I could see John Fitch, uh, you know, Fitch Maya. That just makes a lot of sense. Um, Chris, I believe you you had stated the winner of. Uh, BJ uh, Penn versus Roy McDonald would be a good fight for for Fitch. I think you couldn't be more spot on. That just makes all the sense in the world for all the right reasons. Um, so definitely a, a, a lot of great ways to go. I think um, personally, I'd say Fitch Maya would would be a good fight. Um, definitely a grappling heavy match that I think would would pull through and be very exciting. Um, just because for me, I, I love seeing the grappling, you know, as long as it's not, um, you know, D one wrestler versus D one wrestler, uh, jockeying for top position, you know, if it's going to the ground and we're seeing lots of sweeps, we're seeing the transitions, we're seeing the sub attempts, you know, I love it. Um, so hopefully, uh, we, we can get something like that. I think Fitch, um, Fitch Maya's way to go. Uh, as, as far as Eric Silva, I do like him taking on Rick Story. Um, at the same time, though, I think that'd kind of be the third fight in a row. He's kind of getting the same kind of fighter. I mean, he fought uh, Charlie Brenneman before that, primarily a wrestler. Uh, you know, obviously just coming off of the the uh, John Fitch fight, we know what he does. Uh, Rick Story, also with the wrestling background, Um Rankings wise, I think it, it definitely makes sense. They're kind of around the same position in the division, um, but like Ray had mentioned, it kind of depends on you know how they want to build story up. If they want to give him enough or another tough fight, um, or if they want to you know get him built back up in the division. So as far as uh, as Eric Silva, gosh, I could see him taking on. Uh, just about anybody at 170. I mean, you could have him go up against uh, Aaron Simpson or uh, perhaps even Mike Pierce, who's just coming off of his win. Uh, he's he's currently only sitting at, at one win in a row. Uh, so I, I think something could be done there as well. Yeah, really could. Um, and unless any of you guys have anything else to throw in on the fight of the night, uh, let's move ahead to Glover Teixeira versus Fabio Maldonado. I did Origi all right, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I think you guys had awesome breakdowns. Let's uh, let's move on. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, Glover Teixeira versus Fabio Maldonado, originally slated to be Rampage versus Glover um, in a fight I don't really thought Rampage deserved. Um, or at least I don't think he deserves to fight Glover after this performance he put in against Fabio. One of the most brutal beatdowns I've ever seen. I mentioned earlier, I I thought the first round was a 10-7, which you rarely, rarely see. Even when a guy beats the other guy the fuck up, it's still a 10-8. Glover showed no remorse, just was hammering it. You know, it it uh, kind of reminded me, when I first get get a video game, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the uh, difficulty down to, like, the lowest possible and just have my, my first go-round be an absolute drubbing. And I did the same thing with the UFC 3. I turned it down to the level where a five-year-old could, could play it. And I marched the computer around the ring and absolutely destroyed it. It didn't look like it had a chance, and it didn't have a chance. And that's what what Glover did. Fabio spent a good portion of, of this fight with his back against the cage, just getting unloaded on. Combos, you know, left, right, 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 left. Glover was showing zero remorse. Had the first round 10-7. Uh, the second round was, you know, Glover starting to to uh, kind of back off somewhat. Uh, wasn't really going after him as hard as he did in the first. I gave the second round 10-9 to Glover. And I was kind of surprised it got stopped after the second and not any time in, in the first. Um, you know, it was, it was an absolute beatdown. And Glover Teixeira wins this one by uh, Dr. Stoppage after the second round. This for me was just a, an a, unbelievable show from Glover. From Glover, Glover, he just looked amazing. He looked on a he looked on a uh, in a completely different league to Fabio Maldonado. And now Maldonado, Maldonado showed an absolute ton of heart. Uh, and the crazy thing was at the end of round one, after being absolutely battered, like you say, for the ten seventh round, he then goes and throws a punch that visibly rocks Glover Teixeira, which he just didn't see coming. Uh, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, end, yeah. I mean, in the end, when the referee uh, stopped, when the doctor stopped the fight, it was a kind of relief because he just looked at Fabio. And I mean, I felt sorry for him that the fight was stopped because I could see in, in his heart he wanted to go on. And I felt sorry for him for that. But he was taking too much punishment. I mean, the guy has just got a massive, massive will. I, I can't say how much respect I've got for that guy after that fight. It was just amazing. He just, oh, I don't know, he just showed so much in defeat. It really was impressive. Impressive indeed, good sir, Mr. Ray. Uh, it, it was fantastic, fantastic fight. Um, that first round was such a beatdown. And, um, you know, when a guy like Chuck Liddell says, oh, you know, uh, Glover's just, uh, he's the best 205er out there. I don't put too much stock into that, considering how many blows Chuck has taken to the head. You know, maybe I'm thinking, eh, he probably, you know, probably isn't really... Uh, he doesn't have his wits about him, but after the last two fights, seeing what he did to Kingsbury and Maldonado, uh, he is ready for top 10. I'd, I'd love to see him against anyone in the top 10, man. I mean, he hits like Tyson. He subs like Mir. The guy is just absolutely fantastic. Um, he's really, really living up to the hype. I thought, okay, a guy who spent most of his career in Brazil and in uh, the, uh, the the smaller shows – I, I didn't put too much stock into him, but after these kind of performances, you can't help but say this guy is legit, and I could see him matching up well against just about anyone at light heavyweight. And like uh, Ray had so poignantly said earlier, Maldonado is uh, a Spartan, absolute Spartan. The guy comes in, has some chub on him, you know, has some little little man boobs. He's thrown some awesome uh, boxing technique, but uh, the guy can take. Uh, you know, a licking and keep on ticking. And it was just fantastic to see that happen. I mean, a, a doctor came in and stopped the fight. Uh, Maldonado didn't want to stop. He wanted to keep on going. He was dejected that they stopped it. That's That goes a long way, and I think we need more of that in the sport. Yeah, w- without a doubt. Uh, Maldonado, he just showed. He he is a, a man's man. He is truly a person that if, if you, if you have a pair of, of balls, you have to respect Fabio Maldonado. He took this fight. And let's be frank. No one wanted to fight Glover to Everybody is turning down Glover to right now. Uh, to be quite honest, I'd heard of the hype. 
Hadn't even seen any of his fights. All the guys in my camp got me on board for him uh, with, with the Kingberry fight. I didn't think he'd be able to handle Kyle Kingsbury the way he did. Uh, a big, durable, light heavyweight in his own respect. And I, I was kind of, uh, you know, in spite of that performance, I was a little hesitant to, to say he would just walk through Fabio Maldonado the way he did because Maldonado, he's a great boxer. If nothing else, he has a really good stand-up uh, skill set. Um, and he's also got a chin that's just made out of diamond. I mean, this guy uh, just, w- which was evidenced throughout the ten rounds of this or the ten minutes of this fight went. Um, for him to to remain conscious was just uh, a feat beyond words. Um, and, and Glover Teixeira, you know, gosh, just the the way he impressed, he just comes out like a a beast. You know, he's a guy he doesn't strike me as as a, a point fighter, you know, or a, or or a game planner, if you will. Not in the sense that he's not an intelligent fighter, because he's clearly a very intelligent fighter. And I think just that the difference is, I think it, to me, it seems like his his ability doesn't come through game planning. It just seems like he is such a grimy, dirty fighter. I mean, not like dirty in a you know he cheats and he breaks the rules, but just this guy is a savage, and it's just. It's just in his nature, the way he transitions from the striking to the ground game. It, it's it's just a, a brutality in, in a manner that you just you can't imagine being able to be taught. Um, th- this win just, my God, it, it, it does so much for Glover to share in the rankings. And I'll tell you what, if no one wanted to fight him after the Kingsbury fight, I honestly cannot imagine anyone who would want to fight him now. Um you know, I, I think him and John Jones might meet sooner rather than later just because it's hard enough for the UFC to find anyone to fight either of those guys. So, um, you know, it, it does look like Rampage is on board for the Teixeira fight, which, you know, I'm just I'm so excited for. I haven't been this excited for a Rampage fight probably since uh, his fight with Dan Henderson at UFC 75. I mean, it's it's been that long. Um, but uh, that that should be a great fight if it comes to fruition. And. I, I don't see it being very long before Teixeira and John Jones are matched up. Yeah, um, and and for Fabio, you know, kind of in the same place as Wagner Prado, probably uh, probably take on a third or fourth tier 205 or like maybe a Kingsbury or a Elliot Marshall or or maybe even uh, Prado versus Maldonado. But Glover Teixeira, I, you know, I'm. I am definitely on on board with you stylistically. Rampage versus Glover is is a dream fight. You know, two two guys who both love to and can put you out with any punch. But I don't know if if I think Quentin Jackson deserves a fight against Glover. And I know Glover hasn't really beaten anyone of note yet in the UFC. Only two and zero beat Kyle Kingsbury and uh, Fabio just a couple of nights ago. But I look at Quentin Jackson's record: four and four in his last eight, and that's including the split decision controversial win against Leota Machida. Um, and his other his his other three wins are against Matt Hamill, Keith Jardine and Evanderlei Silva out of his prime, who had yet to move back down to 185 pounds. Really the last time he's he's gone out there and really, really impressed me was the fight against Dan Henderson back at UFC 75 in, in 07. And, you know, yes, he did look good hanging in there with, with Lyoto Machida. That, that was a toss-up. And even though I thought Lyoto won, I could see maybe giving Rampage the, the end nod because it was a close fight. But, um, you know, I would rather see Glover take on the, the winner of Gustafson Shogun, who fight in early December. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. But uh, as far as Glover uh, versus Rampage, you know, it'll probably be a story when the lines open up in Vegas because it's looking like uh, Dana White's hinting that that's going to be his next fight. Um, it'll be be a surprise to a lot of people when Rampage opens up an underdog in Vegas against Glover, which if Vegas has any sense, they'll they'll give give the edge to uh, Glover because Jackson, you know, yeah, he is talking a little bit back with Glover now, saying he really wants that that fight. But he's just looked, you know, looked like his heart isn't in it. Um, and, and you know, if 
you know, <laughs> when he weighed in for that Ryan Bader fight, that's when I thought, all right, officially his mind is out of the sport. He weighed in six pounds over, um, got manhandled by Ryan Bader in in Japan, where he had been talking about leading up to it. Oh, you know the uh, jet. The Japanese crowd is my favorite crowd. I love my pride days. I want to go back and impress him. If he couldn't get it done against Ryan Bader in Japan, I don't see how he's going to get get it done against Glover Teixeira anywhere. If that's the fight that's going to be, then obviously I just want to see uh, Rampage get you know get kind of put out of his misery. But if I could pick a fight for him, that's not the fight I'd be picking. I I agree with what, with what Patrick said. I don't think Rampage is worthy of a fight with Glover Teixeira. I don't think it does anything for Glover Teixeira to beat Rampage. It's a kind of a lose-lose situation. If he wins, he's expected to win. If he loses, he falls quite a way down the ranking. So that's, for me, it's not a fight I'd give him. I'd like to see him take on a top-10 opponent. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, I think Phil Davis would be a good fight for him because as we go towards the top end of that division, there's a lot of wrestlers, as there is in most of the divisions. So we need to see how Glover's going to do against the wrestler. Uh, Phil Davis has looked good. The only loss he's got is to Rashad Evans, which obviously there's no shame in that. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I personally would like to see uh, Phil Davis versus uh, Glover Teixeira. As for Fabio Maldonado, I, I read somewhere that he's not going to be cut because obviously he's lost his last few fights. But I think they were that impressed with the the amount of heart he showed and even the way he wanted to come out and fight for that third round, which you just couldn't help but, that, you know, as I said before. So I think it's great he's not being cut. I'd like to see him put up against someone else who will stand and strike with him because I think that's his strength. And it'd be nice to see him get a win after some of the performances he's put on. Uh, so if uh, if Joey Beltran beats Anthony Peroche, which I'm hoping that he will, I think that he will. I know that fight's probably about six weeks down the line, but you've got to think Fabio's going to need some time to recover after this fight anyway. I wouldn't mean I wouldn't mind seeing Fabio Maldonado take on Joey Beltran. I think that'd be quite a good fight. You beautiful man and your awesome breakdown. I love it. Um, your velvety smooth <laughs> voice. Yeah, it's silky and smooth. The MMA mentalist. Um, uh, yeah, at, as far as Rampage goes, you know, we opened up with that. Um, let me just go ahead and say that he was one of the, the top guys out there. He was the top guy. He was the kingpin. He defended his title against Dan Henderson in a very exciting fight at UFC 75. Knocked out Vanderlei. Um, but as far as his mindset goes, you guys brought that up. He has looked absolutely underwhelming. And you know what? Um, I saw him on the MMA hour. Uh, Matt Mitrione actually called into the show while Rampage was on there and cut to like 20 minutes later. They're just barking at each other. Uh, you know, Rampage oof, is like, yeah, oof, knock, uh, you out. Oof, knock you out, man. I'm going to knock you out. You have no idea what I'm going to do to you. And Mitrione's like, yeah, brother. We're going to see. I'd love to knock you out. And I'm just like, man, this is some typical alpha male stuff right here. The guy doesn't deliver anymore. He's at odds with the promotion. Why are you trying to you know, pick a fight with a heavyweight who doesn't even have a great record? Um, I think he's absolutely lost it. So I I, I agree with all you guys. Uh, Teixeira needs to go you know, on to better things. And as much as I want to see him put a beating on Rampage Jackson, I don't think that's the best move. So um, you know what? Glover just needs a good fight. I think Phil Davis, uh, I'm going to co-sign that. I think that's perfect. Uh, we're we're going to finally see how he hangs with a top wrestler. You know, Kingsbury is a big, strong guy, but he's not exactly known for his wrestling. And then, uh, you know, you you have all uh, these other guys like Maldonado. He's a jiu-jitsu guy with some boxing. So that makes perfect sense. As far as Maldonado goes, um I think that was, that was a good choice. Uh, Beltran, if he gets past, uh, who was it? Who was he fighting again? Help me out. Uh, Anthony Peroche. Peroche, yes. If Beltran gets past Peroche. That would be a fantastic fight. Um, you know, I, I think I'm just lingering here. So I, I agree with all of that. I don't really have much to add to it except for the fact that Teixeira needs a real stern test in the top 10. And I think Maldonado deserves a break. After uh, you know losing controversial decisions to Kingsbury and Igor Pokryuk alike, well, the uh, mutual admiration society meeting is uh, is officially in in order now. I, I agree with absolutely everything you guys are saying. Um, for me, with with where these guys go next, especially with Glover Teixeira, it really just depends on who will fight him. Um, you know, uh, Jake, I believe you had mentioned uh, potentially him taking on the winner of Gustafsson Shogun. 
I, I think that's that's a good move rankings wise. Um, I'm not sure if that fight's being slotted as a number one contender at 205 right now. Uh, I know that there's been some rumblings about that. Um, so that could very well be the way this goes. Um, you know, Ray, uh, you, you're spot on in, in suggesting Phil Davis versus uh, Glover Teixeira. Uh, he's, uh, Phil Davis, he's just a, a unique specimen. Uh, he's, he's got a very unique frame for, for 205 pounds. He's a uh, John Jones-esque. He's a taller fighter, very rangy. Uh, he's, he's just got the lats. He's just got the wings that, uh, you know, are, are, are unreal. Um, and I think he, he uses that leverage very well at 205, um, really uses that wrestling well. Uh, you know, the only fight we saw him, uh, really having any trouble with was, was with Rashad Evans and Hey, who doesn't have trouble with Rashad Evans, former light heavyweight champion, uh, immaculate record, um, so if, if Phil Davis and Glover to share against set up, I think that's a good route to go. Um, yeah, at this point, I think it's just basically whoever will fight him. If, if Rampage is going to fight him, hey, good, you know, um, that that lets Glover, uh, you know, keep trying to get those wins coming in, and you know that saves Phil Davis uh, from from getting ran over and having to go uh, back down the ladder. Um, of course, you know, conversely, Phil Davis could could very well show us something. Uh, that we might not know about Glover, and hey, who knows? You know, he could he could come out and and submit Glover, so that could uh, be a very good matchup as well. And, and as for Maldonado, Chris, like you had mentioned, um, you know, he had those two split decisions against Kingsbury and Igor Pokryak, and um, you know, the case can certainly be made that he won both of those fights. And so you combine that with the fact that he he stepped up on on relatively short notice to take Glover to share a Again, a guy who nobody wants to fight. Um, you, you can't let him go. Fabio Maldonado, he is a true a true fighter. Uh, you know, the kind of guy that the, the sport was just built around. Um, he, he will obviously just step up and fight anybody. Um, so as far as who he gets, uh, Ray, I think you're, you're just on top of your matchmaking duties today. I think uh, him versus Beltran would be great. Um, that fight, uh, Beltran versus Paroche, that is slated for December at UFC on FX6, I believe. But you know what? That works out great for me because that's a couple months that Fabio Maldonado gets to sit and rest. I mean, he's probably looking at least a, a 60-day no-contact suspension for this. Um, I don't know if the official suspensions have come out for that, but I, I would be shocked if he didn't get 60 days with no contact. Um, so I think that works out perfect. He'd get to serve the suspension. Um, and then we get to see how that fight shakes out and, uh, he'd be able to train accordingly. So, yeah, I think, um, I think Maldonado Beltran provided Beltran gets through, um, Paroche. I think that's a good one. Or of course, uh, another name we had mentioned earlier, James Tahuna, um, Tahuna Maldonado, that'd be a great fight. Both real big light heavyweights, both sluggers. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, uh, a good a good lot of options for both fighters definitely um and unless any of you guys have anything to throw in on uh, to share versus Maldonado I other do. than other than Chris uh go ahead right I think we all write that down really well let's move on well, <laughs> thank you I, and I'm going to go ahead and co-sign Ray's I sentiment hate both of you so let us move on to our bonehead of the week. Boom, 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 My bonehead of, of the week, actually, it was a group of boneheads. Um, something that, that wasn't exclusive to this UFC 153 card. I don't understand the mentality of a fan who goes to a fight, which I've I've never been to a fight drunk out of my mind, and I'm assuming most of the people who try to do this are drunk out of their minds, but you're having a trained killer, one of the best fighters, you know, not one of the best people who can shoot a basketball, not one of the best people who can throw a baseball or catch a football, one of the best fighters in the world, somebody who could easily knock out any person from your hometown in a back alley fight. So you, you know, okay, I'm going to a fight. No, no, no. 
hey, I have a really great seat, which I don't understand. You know, these are amazing seats that probably cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. If I'm dropping over $300 on a ticket, I'm going to want to remember it. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm going to want to get that wasted. But it, I, I couldn't imagine any other scenario where you try and reach out and steal a fighter's hat other than being wasted out of your mind. And it happened a bunch at UFC 153. You would think Anderson Silva and Big Nog, you know, two legends in, in Brazil, uh, really, really esteemed fighters, both of them got, got their hats stolen right off the uh, top of their their heads. Luckily, uh, when Wagner Prado walked out, someone tried stealing his hat. Those were cat-like <laughs> reflexes. I mean, someone no! reached out, grabbed it, and as he's pulling the hat backwards, Wagner turns around, grabs it, no, uh, picks it off, takes it from him. Personally, you know, just just make these aisles a couple feet wider for for the fighters. Yeah, you might lose, you know, the uh, room for a couple dozen seats, but it you know it kind of works into fighter safety as well. Because we see over and over, I want to say an average of two or three hats get lifted every single pay-per-view. And that's a very conservative average. You know, if if someone's going to be able to take the hat from you, they can punch you in the face. Which, you know, they can poke you in the eye. They, you know, with, with the uh, BJ Penn thing, they can kiss you on the cheek and take away all of your power. Um, you know, they... <clears throat> I really don't know if it's the the security's fault, or if it's these fans' fault, or if it's the planning fault and not making these aisles a little bit wider, but the fans have too much access. You should not be able to take the hat off of a fighter while he's walking out to, to the fight. And not just this Brazilian crowd, but any fan who goes to a UFC and steals a hat off of a fighter, you're my bonehead of the week. Bonehead of the week. Yeah, bum, definitely. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> so many fighters get jacked, and it's hilarious because I'm rooting for those guys to take those hats, but that's neither here nor there. Um, for me, uh, my bonehead of the week is the Silva Big Nog bromance. Oh my god, dude. It, that was literally, I'm going to say, a quarter of the show was, you know, Noguera going out there and winning, and then you go to the back room, and you see Silva just like, hey, carayo, pura, pura. Oh, poor, poor. <laughs> he hasn't even fought yet. He's sitting with his back against the wall, crying, and someone's grabbing him. And now that's amazing to see, you know, as far as uh, humanity. You're like, okay, this guy's a real person. But it just got weirder and weirder. Like, then uh, Silva wins, Nodgara comes in, and Silva's like, oh, obrigado, and jumps on him, you know, jumps into his arms, gives him a kiss, and they're, you know, hugging and kissing in the they octagon. Start making out. <laughs> then. Then uh, they they leave the octagon, and when Silva's leaving, he's hugging Noguera, and they're they're high fiving all the fans. It, it was honestly, I have no problem with gay people at all, but that was a little weird. <laughs> I heard Big Nog took top position after the the uh, fights back in the locker room. I could see uh, Joe Rogan just interviewing uh, Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva, absolutely stunning performance. Yet again, you prove you are the pound for pound champion in the world. How do you feel? I'm not the best. I Big love Antonio. Antonio. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> Big Noguera is the best. He's the best. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I won my fight. And, uh, no, Anderson Silva is the best. No, you're the best. <laughs> Right, I, I don't know how to follow that to be honest with you. I, I, I feel like we've kind of taken a different direction. Right, I've, I've gone for the uh, the who scored the Sam Cecilia Cristiano Marcello fight 30 27 to Marcello. I mean, the fight was extremely close for me, it really could have gone either way. I personally scored it 29 28 to not Sam Cecilia, sorry, Ra- Razor my daddy. I, I personally scored it 20, 29 28 to Razor. I could see an argument for 29 28 to Marcello. When they read out 30 27, I actually thought the result was going to go to, uh, to Razor. I was shocked at 30 27 to Marcello. We see a lot of bad judging, but that for me was, was pretty bad. Yeah, I thought uh, Razor pretty convincingly won rounds one and two. Yeah, 
I mean, it was a very, very close fight. I just didn't think 30-27 made sense at all for Marcello. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with that, Ray, that there, there's absolutely no way that that was a 30-27 fight for, for Marcelo. That was uh, just out, outstanding home cooking uh, for, for the Brazilian that night. Um, now, my bonehead of the week, uh, a perennial bonehead of the week, bonehead of the card contender, uh, Mario Yamasaki, this guy, for, for my money, has to be the absolute worst ref in the sport of mixed martial arts. And that's saying a lot because we've seen a lot of bad refs, a lot of bad decisions. I mean, we're talking, th- he has to compete with this award against Josh Rosenthal. So you know, I mean, you're, you're doing something wrong if, if you are worse than Rosenthal. And, uh, for me, I think that Mario Yamasaki definitely proved it in his fight against Glover Teixeira. Um, just again, if, if any, if anybody didn't get to see that fight, that was the most savage one-sided beatdown I can recall in, in all of my memory. Literally from any mixed martial arts fight, any kickboxing match, any boxing match, any, any street fight, any jumping. I've seen people get beat by four dudes at the same time that was not as savage as as what Fabio Maldonado endured in this fight. I mean, I was sitting there watching probably two minutes into the first round, and I was just sitting there and I said, what the fuck is Mario Yamasaki doing? What is he in the ring for if he's not going to stop this fight? Because to me, there was about a million opportunities where he really could have stopped that fight and, and the thing with Maldonado is, it, and why we had said earlier, you know, this is a, is a man's man. He's taking a fight against someone that no one wants to fight, and he is in there. He's literally, I mean, he was fighting for his life, and there there was never a point of that where he wasn't defending. Which you know, I can understand this the stoppage maybe not coming because as Glover was in full mount, just pounding the shit out of Fabio Maldonado's face. Maldonado, he he was trying to secure wrist control. He was trying to do his thing. He's trying to get back in the fight. And, you know, he he eventually snuck out of the mount, probably about two minutes after the fight should have been stopped. But, you know, he was able to get out. He was able to rock uh, to share at the end of that. But but honestly, just looking at that fight, what are referees there for? They're, they're there for fighter safety. And at, at a certain point, I'm watching this fight, and I just think, the amount of concussive damage that Glover Teixeira did to Fabio Maldonado, it, it's hard for me to think that that won't shave at least a year off his life. No joke. And, and potentially <laughs> lead to, to, to some serious, long, long-lasting long repercussions. I mean, if, if, if you know, I, I just wonder if Mario Yamasaki's ever dealt with the kind of injury that, you know, never goes away. Because that's the kind of thing that, you know, I love to see the great fights. I love to see people get knocked out. I love to see people get submitted. But I don't want to see someone get get beat to the point where, you know, they, they can't remember what street they live on. And I felt that this fight was, was just getting into that territory. And um, it, it's a, a terrible job by, by Mario Yamasaki, if you ask me. That fight should have been stopped. Um, I... I I just I can't even come up with words. He needs to be sanctioned. He needs to be fired, and he needs to never, ever, ever be in the sport of MMA again in any capacity. And uh, yeah, you you really broke that down beautifully. And there there's a reason the referee is in the cage, and probably the main reason is to make sure that the person taking damage doesn't take too much damage. And there may as well have not been a ref in in the uh, cage. It was a doctor's stoppage. I mean, Yamasaki literally did nothing in that fight. Um, should have been waved off at multiple points during the first round. So that is why I'm choosing your your nominee as my uh, overall bonehead. Cristobal. Uh, am I supposed to say something again about this? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, see, overall, see uh, with yeah, bonehead of, I, I of the week, works. every week we pick a nomination. This is the third time, you <laughs> son of a I'm bitch. Fucking with, fucking with you. I know how it works. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say I, I have nothing against Yamasaki. That's his personal take. Uh, I didn't see the Marcel fight. I can't 
pick my own, so I'm definitely going with those goddamn hat stealing fans. <laughs> I'm gonna vote for uh, for Patrick Yamasaki. I think that that, that he deserves both head of the week. Well, thank you for your nomination, Ray, and uh, um, you know I, I can't vote for my own. I'd certainly love to. I think I do an excellent job on this show. Um, but and, and you guys also came through with a lot of great boneheads of the week. Um, I will have to go with, um, I, I will have to go with a thirty twenty seven in the the Monadi Marcelo fight. Um, there's no way that fight was thirty twenty seven for either fighter. Um, yeah, and that and that's pretty much it. It's just that was that was a super close fight. Um, anyone who had that thirty twenty seven is just mentally deficient. Don't make fun of me. So yeah, looks like our bonehead of the week is gonna be Mario Yamasaki. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, let's let's um let's move on to the main event and the co-main event. We had Big Nog fighting Dave Herman and Anderson Silva fighting Stefan Bonner. Um, oh yeah, hey, before we jump into that, can I just say yeah. one thing to wrap up the bonehead of the week? Wrap and that up is the bonehead. Fuck, fuck wrap Mario my bone. Yamasaki. Him, Fuck. him, and his brother Fernando. What is, is isn't that fool's name Fernando Yamasaki or something like that? Those dudes, oh, just, they suck a bag. I think it's of his dick. cousin. Yeah, yeah I, either way, they they got to go. Yamasaki, I've only seen him at the two Brazil cards, and I've I've got an immediate displeasure for him as well. I think but, Levine uh, is worse. Oh, they're they're all so bad. They're so bad. Let's get him out of there. Get him the fuck out. My uh, least favorite ref is uh, oh wow I'm totally Kim Kim Winslow yeah I oh God, yeah she's so hot dude I mean terrible she's terrible terrible <laughs> hot same thing um so uh, yeah we had Big Nog versus Dave Herman end up being the submission of the night which makes it I ironic when you find out that Dave Herman was saying jujitsu does not work before the fight. Um, the first round had a lot more standing up and clinch work than the second round, and and the second round was a straight jujitsu clinic. Herman was doing the right things; he was defending the right way, but it seemed like Big Nog was a step ahead of him every time. Um, he uh, goes goes for a choke, takes his back. Uh, Herman actually gets out, stands it back up. Big Nog slams him back down, goes for an arm bar. Herman rolls the right way and everything, but uh, Big Nog was just a step of the, a step ahead and still clinched up the arm bar and the entire crowd. That was that was probably the loudest the the crowd got uh, during the entire fight when Big Nog won his second uh, second straight fight in in Brazil against Dave Herman. Uh, really nice. Nice moment seeing the whole crowd go crazy, Anderson go crazy, and uh, yeah, you know, I was, I was, I was kind of wondering how, how, um, how he would be able to rebound off that horrible submission loss back last year, late 2011, against Frank Mir at UFC 140, but roars back and, and uh, at least personally, I think this vaults him back in the top ten of heavyweights. And I guess if uh, Patrick, I'm not sure if he's, he's back. back. He's back. Oh, oh I'm. He's I'm back. Heard. Yeah, you know, and and I definitely agree with you, Jake. I mean, uh, you know, no, Gary, you he he didn't fall too far out of the top ten. I mean, of course, there's definitely some concern with his uh his performances as of late. And I mean, this is talk about a fighter with some road miles on him. Uh, big Nog, he's just been through some absolute wars. Uh, going back to early in his career against Fedor, um, you know his fights with Crow Cop. He's he's been in the thick of some shit, and uh, you know the, it was it was a good showing. I was incredibly concerned to see him come into the weigh-ins. Uh, he did not look very in shape, you know, and and he just had his arm savagely broken not not incredibly long ago uh, by Frank Mir, and just the kind of arm break that that was. I mean, this was an upper arm break. Uh, very, very hard to rehab. Um, and, and for him, it, it looked like it was going to be a close fight in the beginning. Herman, he came out, he was throwing some good strikes, uh, throwing up the, throwing up the leg kicks, uh, both to the body, going for some head strikes, uh, trying to get big Nog to block with those arms. 
Um, and he, he landed some very good trips too. I, I thought, um, you know, I, I thought Herman might do it, but I'll tell you what, the, the MMA fan in me, the, 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 the nostalgia lover in me could not have been more happy for that, uh, for that win for Big Nog. Uh, I believe that was just his second win in Brazil, uh, his first submission win in Brazil. And, um, it, just great to see Big Nog get back to his winning ways and, um, you know, I, I think he stepped in on a little short notice when the 153 cards started to fall apart. Um, so hopefully he takes his time, gets back 100 percent, just gets in a little bit better shape, um, you know, because it's all about extending that career. If he can just stick around for a little while longer, um, hopefully he gets to, to come in shape and, and continues getting back on the right track. For me, I'm going to be a bit of a downer, really. For me, this was, was a nothing fight. I mean, I know uh, a few people mentioned it in, in our camp as well about Nagara didn't look great at the way, and he, he, you know, he carried a little bit of extra weight. But the thing was, he was fighting Dave Herman, and Dave Herman is a terrible fighter. He just brings, I mean, he's he's done nothing in the UFC since he joined. He looks completely out of place. You know, he, he, there's times where he's he's openly said that he doesn't even train or prepare for fights. I just can't take the guy seriously, to be honest with you. I was glad Nagara beat him. I was glad he, su- he was. I was glad he was. Su- he submitted him. You know, we don't. We don't. Uh, we don't fight now in an age in MMA where jujitsu doesn't work. We know it works. It's always worked. You know, it worked right in UFC one. It still works now, especially when you get you know someone at the, the high level that, that Nagara's at. So I was glad that Dave Herman got his comeuppance. I don't. I didn't learn anything from this fight about Nagara. I didn't learn anything about this fight from Herman. I know it was a short notice fight. I don't know, really know what how much nagara has got left in him. Really, for me, he's never ever going to be a, a contender. He's he's a gate. He's a solid gatekeeper. But I wouldn't be too disappointed to hear that he he was going to retire. I think he's had an amazing career. I mean, especially his Pride FC days. I don't think we got the best of him in the UFC. But uh, yeah, I didn't. It, it was a it was an entertaining fight, but I didn't learn anything from the fight. Nothing. No one's gone. Any, no one's changed anything in the rankings up or down out of these two, in my opinion. Very astute, Mr. Ray. Um, Herman has looked like dog shit. Came in, beat a uh, very inexperienced MMA guy in John Olaf Inamo. Has lost three in a row, all by finish, TKO, knockout, and submission. So he's lost by every means possible out there. Um, As far as him training or not, it doesn't really matter. He looked like crap in there against Noguera. Noguera looked fat. Um, You know, he looked uh, motivated, but that's in front of a hometown crowd. If you put Noguera in there against Velasquez, Dos Santos, Overeem, uh, Big Country, any of these guys, he's going to lose. Even Carwin. I'd give Carwin an awesome shot at beating him. I I think he's definitely seen his best days. Um, What what really bummed me out most about this fight was that uh, when uh, Noguera won, I really wanted uh, them to take like a you know a kid who maybe had like some kind of disease and bring him in, bring in Anderson, and then they all just kiss each other on the mouth. I thought that would have been a nice ending. <laughs> I would have liked that too. Jake. Um. Yeah. I I thought yeah, Chris so, uh, Chris was still show, guys. I was I was pretty sure Chris was still talking about guys kissing each other on on the mouth. I was almost finished. <laughs> I don't know what you were doing. Oh, that's that's a, a that fascinating was, subject, and I'm sure one silence. Chris could go on all day about. Yeah, yeah. I, I it uh, sounded like Chris was in in the uh, middle of of a thought there that I rudely interrupted uh, openly support uh, dudes kissing each other on the mouth no, in the middle of the no, ring. That was it. That's all I had. I was just making a little joke. <laughs> Stop, stopping super abruptly on dudes making out. So um, <laughs> Yes, and, and later on, stay tuned for Chris's impersonation of Matt Hamill kissing a dude. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Um, so, so for both of these guys moving forward, um, I think originally most people had Big Nog ranked above Herman, you know, the UFC likes to put guys who just lost against other guys who, who just lost, um, Herman, you know, coming off three straight losses, but I don't think the UFC is going to cut him just because those losses have all come to top 15 heavyweights and Struve Nelson and Big Nog. Um, maybe a fight against Pat Barry. Um, both of those guys have had kind of rocky recent past recently. Um, and as far as Big Nog goes, you know, I'm thinking of a fight that that makes sense. 
you know, Ray, I, I, I definitely agree. Even though I think of Big Nog as the second greatest heavyweight of all time, I don't think he's going to challenge Junior, Kane, or Alistair for that belt. Um, you know, maybe a, a fight against the up-and-comer Stefan Struve. I think Big Nog is an elite gatekeeper. Struve, you know, he, he is on an impressive four-fight win streak against uh, Barry. Also beat Dave Herman, finished him in the second round by punches. Uh, and LeVar Johnson and Stipe Miocic. Uh, yeah, I want to see Big Nog versus Stefan Struve. What about you guys? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very intriguing matchup right there. Definitely a, a good fight for both guys, a, a winnable fight for both guys. Um Gosh, you know, as far as what to do with both these guys, it's a tough, tough question. Um, you know, Ray brought up, brought up a really great point just about uh, Big Nog. You know, he he won. He didn't get the most super impressive victory over Dave Herman, who himself hasn't been super impressive in the UFC. Um, if I'm not mistaken, guys, I'm thinking his only win was a. Uh, it, it was it was a true barn burner uh, against John Olivinamo, but uh, again another guy who really hasn't done much in his career. We know uh, Inamo went zero and two in the UFC, um, so this is a tough one. You know whether or not Dave Herman's still going to be in the UFC is, is kind of up in the air. I'm not sure if he's been cut. I don't know if, if they've uh, released any of that yet. Um, gosh, as, as far as Nog, I think Struve would be a good matchup. Uh, makes sense. I think still, um, even in spite of, of Nogueira's recent years, I think they're still very comparable on the rankings. Uh, so it, it definitely makes sense in that regard. But, um, you know, now that Ray mentions it, this this would not be a bad time for Big Nog to retire. Um, just simply, I mean, you got to win in Brazil. You got a submission. And, uh, you know, the submission game is, is the trademark of, of Big Nog. So I, I don't know that you could leave on, on a much better point unless, you know, it was a, a second consecutive submission win in Brazil. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd, uh, if, if Big Nog doesn't retire, I think, I think Struve is a good fight for him. And as far as Dave Herman, you know, it, we'll have to see if he's even in the UFC come next week. Right, I, I wouldn't be too disappointed to see Nagara retire. And I think that doesn't take away from what he's done in the sport because calling him the second best heavyweight uh, ever isn't far fetched at all. I mean, in his pride days, you know, the guy was absolutely phenomenal. And the only the only fighter that ever could ever touch him in the pride days was Fedor, who obviously was was in a league of his own. Uh, and I said before, we haven't seen the best of him in the UFC because he's coming towards the back end of his career. But he still had a good impact in the UFC, and he's put on some amazing fights in the UFC. So. I, I wouldn't be disappointed to see him retire, but retire, and I think he retires on a high, and he goes down as a legend. They should induct him into the Hall of Fame, you know, regardless of what's, what he's done in the UFC. Forget that. It's what he's done in, in MMA altogether, and he was one of, you know, he was a Pride Fighting Championship, heavy, heavy, pride fighting championship heavyweight champion. But if he is going to stay around, for me, he's a gatekeeper now. You know, that's a, I think that's a sad truth for him to go down, but he is a gatekeeper. And I'd give him, I'd give him someone coming off a loss, and I'd go with Stipe Miocic because I think Miocic needs a win, and I think he would beat Nagara personally. For Dave Herman, I'd like to see him get cut. I don't think he does. I don't think he's good enough to be in the UFC. But if he's not cut, uh, I think he drops really, really low down now. You and you give him to another a, a guy who's up and coming, uh, and I'd give him to Phil. Uh, give him to Phil De Freeze. Yeah, definitely, uh, Ray. I think that Herman, <clears throat> kind of reflecting Ray's sentiments here. I think that guy. If he's uncut, he should face a lower rank guy. If he is cut, he should uh, definitely find somewhere else, maybe Bellator. I, I agree with you 100%. He's a guy who's shown really flashes of uh, explosiveness, but he has zero fight IQ. I mean, yeah, he got out of submissions, but he's been completely dominated his last three fights against a uh, a, a real cadre of uh, different type of fighters you had big country you had struve and you had noguera those are three different guys who all finished him in different means so i think he's proven that he can't hang um me personally definitely noguera should retire but if he doesn't i think he deserves this and you guys are going to call me crazy a number one contender fight um against uh alistair over him i think you're crazy uh, yeah as crazy as that hell? is as crazy as, yes that's nutty that is nutty but guess what 
amazing would it be if he went in there and he won against Overeem and got a title shot? I know that's I don't, nutty. I don't want to see him get annihilated, though. I don't want to see him get annihilated. <laughs> I agree. I think most likely he would get annihilated, but I think he's deserved the right to do that. If he wants to continue, don't put him up against there against unranked guys. Give him, you know, a, a real stiff competition, you know, and that's Overeem. I mean, everyone else out there is signed up for the top ten. Give him over him. If he uh, gets destroyed, then he retires. If not, you know, he wins the biggest fight of his career and gets to fight for a title again. That's my opinion. I know it's weird, but that's uh, that's what I'm going with. Weird, amazing, horrible. Um, yeah, that, that, you know, Big Nog, yeah, he lost to Frank Mir, but right after that, Mir got a title shot. So, a hey, another win... I hadn't really thought of it, but but maybe a fight against a top flight guy like Overeem would be in the cards. I think Overeem's next fight is going to be for for the title as well. So especially if he were to say lose to Kane or Junior, or say he win that, then have Nog match up against whoever he beats, um, that that might actually be a really compelling fight. Especially if it was in Brazil, where Big Nog's proven to us that he fights like a monster. You know, the uh, dude's actually younger than than Anderson Silva. We all think of him as this super, super old fighter, and that's just because he, he's so legendary, has a lot of fights under his belt on a really elite stage. Dude's only 36. I think Anderson is uh, 37. Um, <clears throat> I think he's 37. But um, I'm checking now. Yep, 37. I was right. You guys were wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that would that would definitely be really compelling. Um, any of you guys got any more thoughts on the co-main um, that that aren't dumb and stupid before we go to Silver vs. Bonner? Just quickly, someone said about all the top all the top ten guys are matched up. Uh, Mier, uh, not Mier, uh, Daniel Cormier is not matched up. Uh, Cormier isn't matched up. I'm not sure what what his. Uh, Fate is Overeem supposed to fight the winner of Velasquez dos Santos. Verdum isn't matched up, but a lot of people are hinting he's going to fight Struve next. Uh, Barnett's kind of in that same spot, being in strike force. It's unsure what's going to happen there. Antonio there Silva. Is, there is quite a lot of heavyweights not matched up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and Antonio Silva God not matched it. up. Mark Hunt not matched up. Czech Congo <laughs> not matched up. A lot of guys. Who's not done that research this week? <laughs> um, I guess that would be, uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Anderson Silva versus Stefan Bonner. Like, Anderson's done in a lot of fights recently. He showed absolute disdain for Stefan Bonner striking. You know, gives him all the, the credit in the world as a fighter and as a gentleman. But Anderson Silva, his his corner was screaming at him, and Silva was just standing there with his back against the cage, like he was hanging out, waiting on the subway train to uh, come. Just hey, 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 what's up, man? What's uh, what's what's going on? Let let Bonner land a couple of really hard strikes, and then I want to say about three minutes in. Anderson just kind of like like I've heard Rogan talk about a lot. He's he's a lot like a computer. He'll take those first two or three minutes, just analyze you, break you down. What do you do? How are you fighting? And he flipped that switch, and it was lights out. Stefan Bonner, once Anderson Silva flipped that, that switch, didn't have a chance, uh, swarmed him, actually landed a beautiful combo, landed a, a couple punches that brought Stefan Bonner's hands high to guard his face, and then landed a knee to, to the solar plexus that Stefan Bonner later on said paralyzed him, um, and uh, Stefan Bonner got finished for the first time in his career. Anderson I was Silva. really worried, by the way, when I saw that headline, <laughs> Stefan Bonner paralyzed from knee by Anderson Silva, when I saw that headline, I was like, oh shit! Yeah, that was that was a brutal knee. Um, no one no one can do what Anderson Silva does. John Jones can stop Stefan Bonner. Stefan Bonner had a lot of fights under his his belt. Actually, before the Anderson Silva fight, fifteen and seven had fought tough guys: Mark Coleman, John Jones, Rashad Evans, Forrest Griffin. None of them could stop Forrest Griffin. And Anderson Silva did it in under five minutes. Just, you know, absolutely shows that he is bar none the greatest fighter of all time. Bar none, definitely, uh, you know, well put. 
Anderson Silva is fighting at a different level. At 37 years old, the man continues to become an entertainer. Like, he is entertaining the crowd. He, he was speaking to the crowd, putting his hands up. Are you not entertained? You know, and he was uh, just dodging most of the strikes. Every strike that landed from Bonner was, uh, uh, you know, it would hit him in the face and he would roll with it. He obviously has the amazing ability to not only get out of the way, but when he does get hit, he rolls with the punch. The punch hits him, and he rolls with it to where most of the uh, inertia is actually deflected, which is incredible if you think about it. Um, as far as this fight goes, it was a rocky moment. You know, what if Stefan Bonner could pull it off? But Anderson Silva proved on Saturday night that he is the greatest of all time in any combat sport, and um, you know, I'm never going to count that guy out again ever. Yeah, this was just a. This, this was one of those fights. After I watched this main event, I, I started thinking to myself, I said, what the hell made me think that Stefan Bonner had a chance in this fight? I, I mean, when it first came out, it was and it was announced, I said, this is just the mismatch of the century. Uh, the closer it got to the fight, I think the more I started to say, well, gosh, you know, Stefan Bonner, he fought John Jones. He fought Leota Machida. Um, none of these guys could finish him. Uh, um so I, I definitely I started to think, well, you know, he does have that underrated ground game too. And the the closer it got, the more I, I the more credit I started to give Stefan Bonner. But then I said, you know what? I don't know if it's even possible, but Anderson Silva could be better at two oh five than he is at one eighty five. Um, he he seems faster than the guys there, and just um, just like you and just the the disdain he fights with against his opponent his opponent lately. It's almost like he's just he's contemptful uh, of them, and that they would even dare step into the ring with them. And he just looks like you know I have to make a fool out of this guy for even stepping into the ring with me. And that's absolutely what he did. He backed himself against the cage, was hanging out against the cage, you know, looking like he's waiting for the bus stop. Or, and um, Bonner couldn't do anything to him. Uh, like Chris said the head movement was just on point. You know, really, that's, that's such a huge part of the striking game. If your head movement's good, you you don't you're you're avoiding the shots. Uh, you know, the impact isn't hitting you with full force. Um, and he just he just it, it doesn't matter. Um, this is the only other fight I, I also got um, spot on. Uh, I mean, heck, if if you've never been knocked out before, fight Anderson Silva. You you probably will be after that. Yeah, it was it was just amazing. I mean, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it was just so impressive. And the thing about showing disdain for somebody, it's okay to do that if you can then back it up. You know, we all like to see somebody showing the disdain and then getting caught. But when you see somebody showing disdain and just completely out to their opponent, and let's be honest with you, Stefan Bonner's no joke. I mean, this guy is as tough as they come. He's durable. He's been in there with some of the best fighters. I mean, he is coming towards the end of his career, but he has been... You know, uh, he's a true UFC veteran. I mean, he's one of the guys that instigated the, the big spike in the UFC with his, obviously, his fight against Forrest Griffin, all my fight of season one. You know, it was just a, an amazing display, the way he was ducking and diving and weaving. And then, for me, the, the fight ended with that knee to the body. That that was the end of the fight. The punches on the ground weren't needed. The referee should have just jumped in. You know, from the way Stefan Bonner fell and the way he curled up, the ref should have just jumped in there and then. We didn't need punches on the ground. And Anderson Silva didn't want to throw any more punches, but he had to to get the fight stopped. Uh, but it was just, it was a, it was a, a thing of pure beauty. And, for, and again, for me, I thought the, the KO of the night should have gone to Anderson Silva because that knee for, uh, was much more impressive than any any other strike that was thrown that night, in my opinion, and certainly better than the uh, the Arnie Jason uh, TKO. The knee was just devastating. It was the most powerful strike thrown on the night. Yep, and and looking forward for for both of these guys, sort of a a unique spot both of them are in. Um, Stephen Bonner next for him. I have the UFC studio. You know he's he's a really really great commentator. Uh, breaks stuff down better than any of us could dream of doing. But you know he has a little bit more experience of doing it on a bigger stage. Uh, Bonner is is you know really really. Uh, really well, well spoken, and I don't necessarily, you know, he came out of retirement for this fight. 
Um, if he keeps on fighting, you know there <clears throat> there are a few guys around his his acumen in the 205 division who who just lost. Uh, you've uh, got got guys like Brandon Vera pops in into mind. Uh, hey, a couple other guys, but he needed a giant fight to be offered to him to come out of retirement. And I think he knows, you know, the 205 pound title. Even though he said in the pre-fight buildups, I don't give a crap about a belt. You know, he doesn't really have that much of a chance to win a UFC championship. So probably in his future, I I see him uh, retiring and going back to the UFC studios. Anderson Silva, it's you know I don't know what his future is going to be. Dana White has has promised, literally promised fans that he's going to lock Silva and Sorez in a room and not let himself out until they they come to agreement. Whatever amount of money that's that's going to take. Silva has repeatedly said he won't fight John Jones. This will be his last fight at 205 pounds. Um, you know, I it it could be GSP next. It could be the winner of Weidman versus Boach yet uh, next. According to Anderson Silva, the GSP fight is next, whether GSP wins or loses against Condit. So uh, just just because it has seemed like Anderson Silva has kind of gotten the fights he he wants. Um, you know, he wanted to come up to 205, and he got it. So just based off that, um, you know, I'm personally leaving the door open. I think we might see Silva Jones in the future, especially if Silva beats GSP. I think Silva Jones is going to be kind of the MMA equivalent of Pacquiao versus Floyd. Uh, but yeah, next up for Anderson Silva, I guess I got George St. Pierre. Chris, would uh, you do a George St. Pierre impression of uh, what he would say right before he would fight Anderson Silva? Or how about this? How about this? You know, <laughs> Joe Silva walks into a room, GSP is sitting there with his manager, and he hands him a paper, and it says, you know, next fight, Anderson Silva. Ah! <laughs> 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 There is no way that I think a GSP Anderson Silva fight makes sense. If you cut back to 2009 when they were initially supposed to do it, GSP was looking great. He just finished uh, BJ Penn, and he, he he went on to have some other successful you know title defenses against Tiago Alves. It, it was looking like it made sense because at that time Anderson Silva really hadn't even. Um, shown that um new style where he shucks and jives he he showed that really well against Forrest Griffin I think, I think I think that uh that Anderson Silva is way too big and way too skilled for GSP I think that GSP it, it makes no sense to me that uh the most dominant fighter in MMA history would take on a man that is a lot smaller than he is in GSP I think John Jones makes a lot more sense. It's more compelling. John Jones is a massive light heavyweight with uh, amazing skills and says that he owes uh, his success to Anderson Silva when it comes to striking. He modeled it after Anderson Silva. So I've got I've got uh, Anderson versus Jones as a lock uh, as far as a fight that makes sense. And uh, it's really, really kind of uh, – Sad considering the fact that um, we have a litany of uh, contenders at 185. It used to be the weakest division. Now we have five names off the top of my head that really make sense for Anderson to fight. But in the twilight of his career, he needs big fights. I say make the Jones fight. The GSP fight just doesn't make sense to me at this point in their careers. And, and I couldn't agree more with you there, Chris. Even back in 09, when this fight was was first getting kicked around, you know, and it's always been, oh, yeah, GSP versus Anderson Silva, Cowboys Stadium. I never, ever thought it would make sense. For me, Anderson Silva, he, he's he's too big. He's too good. I see him knocking George St. Pierre out rather easily. Um, you know, maybe that's just me. And, of course, not to slight GSP at all. GSP, I mean, you know, you, you can't say enough about him. I actually model a, a fighter's success just on what I call the, the GSP record, you know, GSP, he's only got two losses. Both of those losses have been avenged. Uh, he's came back and he's dominated everyone since. So he's he's almost got a perfect record in that, in that re- respect. Uh, but it just doesn't make sense to me. He's he's 170. 
Um, he's not close to the same size. I think just all the advantage in the world is with Anderson Silva. Um, as far as the John Jones fight, I, I wish that would happen. I don't know why it won't happen. Um, I would pick Anderson Silva in that fight, quite frankly. Uh, I'd, I'd pick him to knock John Jones out 100%. Um, you know, that would be a lot more competitive than, than Jones GSP. Um, I think, though, really the, the most logical choice is the Boach Weidman winner. Whoever wins that should definitely get the next title shot. And, um, you know, I'll tell you what, before the Bonner Silva fight, I thought that, that Weidman really had a good chance against Anderson Silva. I still think he does, but now, after watching this Bonner fight, I'm thinking, gosh, am I just, you know, am I just giving people chances where they really don't have any? Is, is anyone really going to be able to beat Anderson Silva? Um, as of right now, it, it certainly looks like the answer to that question is a no, but um, only time will tell, and, uh, you know, we just got to see what, what cr- uh, trajectory Anderson's career takes in, in the next couple of years. I uh, I agree with what you said about Anderson Silva and GSP. I'm not really interested in seeing that fight. I think GSP is brilliant at what he does. He's brilliant at his division, but Anderson Silva is is a step above. And I think if it, if he's going to have a pound for pound fight, it makes sense for him to fight more sense for him to fight John Jones than it is for him to fight George St Pierre, in my opinion. And I know you all agree. Uh, the fight I'd like to see him fight next is I'm going to assume that Chris Weidman beats Tim Boach, and I'd like to see Anderson Silva versus Chris Weidman. I personally felt that fight should have been made after Chris Weidman beat Mark Munoz uh, with the elbow. I thought it should have been made after that. Uh, as regards to Stefan Bonner, I'm going to throw something different out there for everyone to think about. Uh, and I can't really take full credit for this because this is someone that this is something that someone else on the playground has been saying, and I'll, and I'll give them credit for it after I've said it. But I think Stefan Bonner, if he was to retire at this point, I think that you know, there's no. There'd be there'd be no disappointment in that. You know, the guy's had an epic career. He's he's certainly been a uh, been great for for the sport of mixed martial arts and great for the UFC. And of course, we'll never ever forget that fight with Forrest Griffin. And if you watch that fight back, it really could have gone either way. That decision. I mean, it was it was it was stupidly close. That fight. It really was. But it, it was that that one fight really where no one lost because it just it raised the profile of the sport and it raised the profile of those two guys and they've both gone on to have fantastic careers in the UFC I'd like to see Stefan Bonner leave on a trademark victory somebody he can look back on and they can always remember that he, he beat this one guy uh, you know he beat this, the big the, the big the big name on his on his uh, on his resume if you like and I'd say uh, let him fight uh, Rampage Jackson I think that's more of a level they're both at and he could have it as a, a loser and winner lo- leaves town after the fight they both retire but I'd like to see Rampage Jackson fight Stefan Bonner. Uh, and the credit for that's got to go to Jay, Jay Jeans. He's the one that put that out there before. But I like I like that idea now more than what I've ever liked. I think that makes a lot of sense. Jay Jeans, the man that uh, Chris has started up uh, lots of Twitter beef with. Not really, but I like to Not say at all, the word actually. Twitter beef. I actually call my junk Twitter beef. But uh, did, did uh, you want to add something, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to ask you guys one last question. Anderson Silva, in the twilight of of his career, we broke this down. We had all of our points. We've had a lot to think about. Let's uh, let's do a uh, MMA roundtable pick. Your perfect last fight for Anderson Silva. Let let's say anyone in MMA, regardless of weight class, who do you want to see him fight? Is I it regardless of time as well? Um, no, someone he could actually fight for his last fight. <laughs> Demetrius uh, Mighty Mouse Johnson. Okay, so Ray brought up Chris Weidman, very deserving of a title shot, um, but Anderson only wants big fights. I think the John Jones fight makes the most sense, and here's why. If Anderson Silva wins, he beat a guy that has looked untouchable, you know, a Terminator, and he can go off into the sunset, and John Jones lost his, uh, he, he will have lost his aura of invincibility and then in his next fight will come out like a bat out of hell. Because you know if John Jones loses to Anderson Silva, he's going to be training harder than ever. I think that is the best possible scenario for uh, Anderson Silva's last fight. Makes sense. I agree with you. Ray? I'd go with Fedor Emelianenko. Let's get the Battle of the Goats. Let's see Ooh, who, who I like that a lot. Yeah, both both uh, could could be argued they're natural 205ers. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, I uh, I think that's a, a great suggestion from Ray. Uh, 
Silva and Fedor, and I tell you what, they they certainly are. If if you're talking about the the greatest of all time debate, it really is Anderson Silva and Fedor at the top of those. Um, you know, of course, John Jones is coming up. He's in the discussion now. Hendo, you look at his body of work. He he makes a case at, at goat. Um, gosh, as far as Anderson Silva, his last fight, the fight to ride him off into the sunset. Um, God damn it, Chris! I hate you for putting me on the spot like this. But um, come on. Oh, fuck my butt. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, let, let's say him and Fedor. That's uh, I, if if that is the epic <clears throat> fight to go out on. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it could get better than that. And really, you know, who would have a better chance against Anderson Silva? But another Terminator like foe in uh, yeah. in Fedor Emelianenko. Definitely. Um, um, I actually wanted to go around one last time as as well. I don't want any reasoning. I just want a one second answer, yes or no. Anderson's been refuting it. Dana's saying it's going to happen. Will we see? Will we ever see Anderson Silva versus John Jones, Chris? Yes. Patrick. No. Ray. No. 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 I say yes as well. So it looks like the MMA podcast. We are the uh, optimists. As usual, and, to you your damn prime. MM, and you damn <laughs> MMA mentalists just think logically and <laughs> mentally, if you will. And we talk um, about poop. We I've talk about poop. I've got to throw in as well. What's that? Right, I've just got in my time machine and I've travelled back in time and I want to see Anderson Silva take on Muhammad Ali. Imagine the showboating in that fight. Oh my god, oh, that would nobody would ever hit each other. <laughs> <laughs> but you boxing know, rules Ali or MMA though, rules? The greatest. Oh. Well, stand up rules. You stand know. up rules, okay. Yeah, no no takedowns, but you've got boxing versus versus the Muay Thai style. <sighs> like uh, like so mixed amazing. rounds maybe, like first round boxing, second round Muay Thai or uh, just, just boxing pull. versus Muay Thai. Third round spaghetti eating. I you know, I actually <laughs> give I would give the footwork advantage to Muhammad Ali, but I don't think we've ever seen a more dangerous striker than Anderson Silva. You wouldn't want to be yeah. a clinch, would you? Oh, no. Absolutely, absolutely not. Incredible. Oh, 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 yeah. If Anderson could break out the, the Muay Thai clinch, I'd I'd pick Anderson first round knockout. But um, huge shout out to our listeners. Shout out to MMA Mental for uh, coming on and chatting with us every Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Follow, follow us on Twitter. We'll tweet out the links before the show. Um, every show's streamed live. Uh, ustream.tv slash channel slash the MMA podcast, all one word if you want to catch us live. Um, that's every Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you want to give a shout out to MMA Mental and let them know what's up, Ray? Yeah, quickly, I'll, I'm going to repeat what I said at the start of the show. We went to our first event of the weekend. We covered uh, an event in Manchester. It was amateur fighting, it's lockdown MMA. It was a brilliant event. There were some great fights, some great submissions. Uh, a brutal knee knockout where, I mean, you have to see it. The guy just stiffened up straight away from the knee. It was just epic. Uh, but we've posted all the fights on the site, so they're worth going to have a look. Most of the fights are quite short as well, you know, so they're, they're fun to watch. So go and watch them out. Uh, this week, we've got three guests lined up. We've got a, a UK heavyweight fights in UCMMA. He's three and two at the minute. His name's Paul Taylor. We've got um, a guy who's just signed with Bama will be making his debut. I'm not sure if he's fighting at Bantamweight or Flyweight, but his name's Spencer Hewitt. And then we've got the UFC welterweight Brian Eversall, who we'll be speaking to live from Bangkok. Wow, that uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and and if you really haven't checked out MMA Mental yet, it's it it is an awesome podcast. Um, it you know, really I, is. You know, I oh, I uh, try and listen to to the Rogan podcast and the Corolla podcast, but I've literally found myself listening to less of those because I'm like, man, you know, I'm getting dressed for work and I have a new MMA Mental or a new Adam Corolla. I'm like, damn, I want to listen to to MMA Mental. Um, and as far as our side, the MMA podcast, no no confirmed guests yet. Uh, we're lining that up as we speak. Check out the website, themmapodcast.com. We'll throw. Our future guest up there whenever we know. Uh, we're live on the same Ustream link I shouted out just a minute ago. Uh, every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Check us out on uh, the MMA Podcast. 
and definitely listen to us. Anyone have anything else to throw in before we uh, wrap it up for the week? I do. I do. What's that? What's you that? Guys Great show, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I got that before. Ah, you guys are gonna do an awesome. So. <laughs> I, I enjoy the hell out of your podcast. Everyone, check it out. And we gone. We gone. Peace.